Hello, and welcome to the Active Atom Educational Series. Part 3D, Rebuilding the Non-Rebuildable Levin Headstock. Say, Patrick, isn't that the headstock that they said over at Levin and many others have said cannot be rebuilt? That is true. It's this model only. Uh, it's an earlier model, not the later model. But this early model used a certain type of bearing that had, it was only manufactured by one bearing manufacturer. And God, I think they discontinued the bearing many, many years ago. And so it's been obsolete for many years. Nothing exists in the old stock out there in the world. We've checked, many people I've known have checked. And, um, and that's why Levin considers this headstock as an unbuildable headstock. Because without the proper bearings, you just can't rebuild it. So, so... Well, I just love that word. Tell me can't and I'll tell you challenge? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember a time when a company that was making a, a watch called an Accutron. Sure. Remember that? That's said, right. That can't be done and those don't get done like that anymore and we don't make that anymore. I said, ah, you don't, do you? Yeah, when we love challenges. Challenges are what make our day. It's what grows us <laughs> and makes us really happy. That's right. That was neat. So let's see here. I'm going to probably hear some back paddling bunch of hogwash, but here it comes. So Patrick, how come we have one of these obsolete barnyard or boneyard finds over here? <laughs> barnyard is probably the right word. How'd that happen? Okay. This is a very interesting story because, okay, the, the headstock we're going to rebuild for this part. Okay. You'd think, why would we have such a headstock? If this can be rebuilt, how'd we end up with one? Well, this is a really interesting story because we only knew half the truth, okay? And the other half that'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. If if you're a Levin enthusiast, uh, you probably know that we, we, we became aware of this from other friends out there that have been Levin fans for quite a while. Yeah, we're in the Levin loop, you know. Yeah, what call it. yeah. exactly. And we have some friends that are just like us, really love Levin. And one of the things we've always been told that if you buy a closed style 11 headstock, stay away from the radius top headstock. That's all we were told. That's all we were told. And I should probably show, show a picture. A picture. Yeah, a picture. Yeah. We have a nice picture of it. They yeah. used to make this. This is after now. This is after the after the open style headstock that we did in part three uh, B, was it? Yeah, hey, let me exactly three part oh, yeah, three look. B. See, and this is actually we have this. Uh, late set up the older model, and this was actually our first complete Levin setup we ever owned. It's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, remember we talked see, about that in 3B. Yeah, and see the open style headstock? Okay, and after that was discontinued by Levin, they came out with the closed style headstock, and you can see it has the radius top to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I call it the grandfather clock. It's got that clock. It's got that clock look to That's it. That's right. Yeah. So we were always told, you know, stay away from that headstock because... That headstock uses these strange bearings strange. that you just cannot find anywhere. And not. That's yeah. what we're told. Okay, so how? So what happened to us? Okay, well, huh. let me give you a little story. Uh, let me backtrack a little bit, and this kind of story will fill but you in I think he's going to give us, us that story. <laughs> so let me listen as well as you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, be, I'll try to be brief, but uh, it's an interesting story. Okay, so I would say maybe about, what, 12, 14 years ago? Uh, okay, we knew at the time to stay away from these type of uh, radius top head stocks, but we had a friend purchase one by accident because he wasn't aware to stay away from this head stock. So he, I guess he had tried to rebuild the spindle. Uh, we knew nothing about it at the time. He took it apart, yeah, looked he, at it, because he has some knowledge. Yeah, he has some knowledge. You know, he contacted Levin, asked Levin, I think. Wah, wah. Yeah, and then Levin told him, oh, yeah, you can't. That uses a special flange style angular contact bearing that that no longer exists, haven't existed for years. We can't, you know, find the bearings anymore. So we can't rebuild this headstock tight. So your only choice is to buy a new headstock. 
basically. Yeah, that's a sales. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a sales pitch, but when you dig into it, it's actually a true statement from them, isn't it? That's right. It's a true statement. Can I so, bust in for a second about, sure. about eBay and those auction houses, I should just say? eBay auction houses. That... Oh, let me get a little further into the oh, story. Sure. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, hearing the depressing news from Levin, you know, he finally contacts us, says, you know, tells us the situation. We're like, oh, yeah, you should have, you should have asked us. We would have told you. We hate that. We hate people that buy something without, you know, giving, asking for our feedback because we would have told him, don't buy a radius top headstock. Yeah, steer yeah. clear. <laughs> so he bought it already. He says, hey, can you help me out? I can't return it, obviously, because I think it was an eBay buy at the time yeah. or something Some or a show purchase or something. So anyways, so he, he tells him, we're like, guy, we have no idea, you know, if we could help assist you on this because we've never rebuilt this style of headstock. We've always been told to stay away from it. So we said, well, okay, well, you know, he's a good friend. So we said, you know, We'll, we'll help you out. They kind of need our help. Yeah, let's do some research. So at the time, you know, we were really close to our mentor who originally showed us how to rebuild all the Levin headstock and spindles. So I contacted our mentor and he gave us an idea. Here, let me uh, bring... Okay, let me show you. Okay, this, is the head, this is actually the headstock we're going to be rebuilding for this part. Okay. And... Uh, he suggested the use of, oh, well, actually, I'll show the parts later. But he suggested, you know, adding a ring here onto the inside, kind of like what we did in part 3B for the open style headstock. Yeah, we put that snap ring in. You remember when with that neat plier and got it right in there? That's right. Yeah, we I did can a show good that. job. Yeah, like that. Yeah, see, just like this, a ring just like that. So I'll tell him, you know, basically our mentor suggested, you know, why don't you just groove the inside right here. I mean, you might have got that idea from that open style, huh? Yeah. I'm think, sure. But everything's common sense. I think so. So he, and that's what he suggested. And I said, well, that's a, yeah, that's a good idea. But then what happened is when we did the measurements, it just wouldn't work because uh, Levin, uh, when they bored this for the two bearing, you know, the two angular contact bearing set. Uh, there's not enough room. It would barely, there's nothing left. Barely hold on. Yeah, nothing left. Barely hold on to this retaining clip. So it just wouldn't work. So we, we were thinking about it. It's like, God, you know, we we gotta find a solution. Yeah, because we don't like hearing no. That's right. We hate hearing no. So we actually we said, okay, you know what? We did come up with an idea, and we'll we're gonna go into more details in the next section. But it does involve making a modification to a new bearing. Okay, so that's what basically what we did. So we came back to the friend and we said, hey, you know, we have a great idea. We have an idea on how this can be done. Okay, this isn't 100% sure. You know, we're, this is our first but time But you got doing nothing this. to lose. Right, so you we got kind of we had a little bit of easiness going on because we go, ah, we're not going to lose right. much. You, you, you either works or it doesn't. You can't do anything. That's right. So we told him, you know, if you can purchase, go on eBay or wherever, purchase two sets of angler contact bearings. You know, this model, we gave him the model. So we want two sets because if we're going to do this, we want to modify two sets just in case we mess something up. Right. You don't want to go in one set. You need a, that's we're right. going to need a pair. Yeah. That's of. right. So, so that's what we did is, so he, he obtained the two sets of bearings, got them to us. But then we were stuck because we have never turned or modified a bearing before. No. So off to our mentor, we went back again, and we're like, "Any suggest? This is the solution we came up with. We're gonna we're gonna uh, modify a bearing or two sets of bearings, but we've never done that before. What's your suggestion?" He says, "Well, first of all, don't attempt to do it on your small watch making or instrument no. lathes. Even your in, your eleven instrument lathes are gonna step up about one size from there, right? The the hardage." Hardage. Exactly. He, he suggested, you know what? I have a friend who owns a hardened uh, instrument lathe. Yeah, there's, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty rigid. Yeah, they're very pretty accurate. Very high, yeah, accurate, high precision. Yeah. But it has a rigidity that he says you absolutely need to have because the bearings are really hard yep. and you need that. So he says, let me, let me talk to my friend and basically make a long story short. You know, he he coordinated. You know, we drove to a, a little machine shop. You know, the guy had this lathe, and we did two sets of bearings. And, um, oh, and one important thing is he also uh, he also had us use a six-jaw chuck. Yeah. And he says you have to use this. If you're going to suggest this modification of bearings to anybody, 
you know, you've got a relay that you absolutely need to use a six jaw chop because- We're spreading out the pressure, is that what we're that's doing? That's exactly. So if you use a three jaw or four jaw chop, you're gonna, you're gonna de deform yeah. the bearing, he said, because because these bearings are hardened, you're gonna be turning, you know, it's very hard. You're gonna have to grip this really hard. And that's why you need the six jaw chop with the six jaws to hold on to it. Okay, so very important. So you need a larger instrument lathe with a six jaw chop. Okay, and that's what we did. So that's your parameters. There yeah, that's you your parameters. So we did that. We came back. Uh, we actually had to do a couple more uh, little modifications, which we'll detail in the next section as well. And after, basically, make a long story short, we were successful, and we only used one set of bearings. Yeah. And our friend, he was so happy, so gracious for our help. Uh, you know, we didn't want to accept any money, but nah. we, he let us keep the second pair of bearings. Well, not needing them. We had no use yeah, for not them. Needing we'll, them. We'll put them with the rest of our 10 million bearings around here. Right. It's like, you never know. Maybe somebody else hey. will approach us because we certainly would never purchase sets of headstock. No, we're, we're smarter than that's what uh, I've yeah. led, led to bleed around here. <laughs> okay. So with that said, uh, so let me, so that's how we learn how to do this modification that we're going to show you. And we do know it works because we've done it once and he used this headstock for years yep. with not a single issue. Okay. So, so here I hold to my hand a flat top style headstock. Okay. It's flat top. So it should have been fine. Should have the bearings like we're used to in our, our newer. That's right. So how, so what's the problem? Well, that's what I want to know. You know, we got this. We actually purchased this on eBay years. I think this is probably about five years you ago. You got it because you wanted a different college size, didn't you? That's you right. You wanted to be more flexible for all of your inventory or something. That's right. Because, see, when we purchased our... That's what he justified. When we purchased <laughs> purchased our second lathe setup, we per, you know, we want a second setup. But we decided, well, let's get an earlier model. So that's why on the second uh, 11 lathe we purchased, we bought it with a closed style headstock. You know, basically the later model, but we bought it with a 3C style. Yeah, headstock. we were starting to get a little bit larger demand. More. Yeah, we wanted more flexibility. Exactly, we wanted more flexibility. But the problem is, is we had jobs that we really missed the D style headstock because we have so many collet sets. That's and our biggest work. That's been yeah. our, that had been our biggest work. Yeah. So I, I went shopping, you know, for a huh. flat top. D style headstock just like this. Found one. Yeah, found one. Good looking too. Yeah, great looking, no damage. Well, of course, it's repainted now. But. Yeah, it's repainted now. But when we got it, obviously, you know, we anticipated it needs a spindle rebuild. It's automatic. So we said, fine, you know, I, we went in and purchased the bearings, opened it up, uh, and to my, I mean, to my shock, it had. The flan style bearing. Same ones the radius headstock has. Yeah, the has. same exact one as the radius top. And we're Could like, not believe it. We we're like, what the heck? Like, oh, what are we going to do? We're made of, not made of money. Right. So I caught right away, I contact Levin and I, I tell Levin, you know, what's the deal? I thought, I thought only the radius top headstocks used the flange bearing. Wow. Well, he says, wow. Well, he there says, there was a little bleed over. Yes. <laughs> he says, when we design the flat top headstock, for the first design, we went ahead and still designed in the flan type bearing, just like the radius top. But then later on, we found out that New Departure, that's the name of the company that made these bearings originally. Well, uh, they were they were made aware that the this bearing type was discontinued. Yeah. So they said, oh, wow, we got to redesign this headstock to use this regular common style yeah. angler contact bearings. So they, they went ahead, they redesigned the headstock. Problem is, from the outside, you cannot tell the difference. They should have identified it differently when they made the change, but they did, but not in a way we would know. Not in a design, right, no. cosmetics. Cosmetic-wise, it's identical. So how do you recognize it? Well, they told us, well, you look at the front metal plate on the front of the headstock oh, yeah. right here. So right here, we don't have the plate. It's not installed until it's done. Yeah, exactly. So the plate, Okay, has the model number and then there's a serial number. And Levin told us if the serial number is below 10,000, it's the early design that uses the flange bearings. So you want to stay away from these 
flat top headstocks with a serial number under 10,000. Yeah, 9999 nine, nine, nine minus. So that's less. right. So, so, so 10, zero, 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 and up. And up. 10, zero, zero, one, two, three, whatever. You're fine. You're great. That's today's modern. You can get them at the corner bearing. And with our luck, obviously, ours was under 10,000. But the all wasn't lost, was it? No, because fortunately, you know, we were disappointed, obviously. They just wanted to get away. Go. We had a job. We need to get it done. Yeah, yeah, and I was kind of mad. I mean, we knew better to stay away from the radius top. We were like, it's like we got suckered into this, and we we're kind of upset about it. But fortunately, we had that backup set of bearings that we modified. So, um, and we kind of dragged this on. We should have actually rebuilt this probably two, three years ago or whenever we purchased this. But we just never did anything with it. Well, lucky it. we didn't because now we can share it. That's right. We get to share it and add it to this full rebuilding series on precision That's spindles. Exactly. So, yeah, we've actually owned this maybe more like four years. So it's actually just been sitting around. We just haven't had the time to rebuild it. So we're going to rebuild it. Got it painted and all cleaned up and everything ready to go. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. And um, let me put that back. Yeah, so that's the whole story. And, um, oh, now you can... Can I finally say about the auction houses? Yeah. Okay, it's a funny one. And it's worth you knowing because if you if you kind of like Levens or anything like it, anything, you just need to pay a little more attention. Do a little research before you rush out and start yeah. bidding on stuff. That headstock's a good example. We see that flat style headstock under 10,000 serial numbers. And yeah. we see that radius to this day, head style headstock. Oh, constantly. On, on those auction sites. And what is and what is it? They're not rebuildable. So I'm going to tell you, we literally see the same pictures reposted. Yeah, we've seen these things come and go probably well forever because we're always checking. But we have a feeling what happens. Somebody <laughs> buys buys <laughs> one. They see this 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 unique uh, bearing type. They contact Levin. Levin tells them can be rebuilt. They go, oh darn it! They re they list it on eBay and just goes through this whole. Endless circle of getting. So if you're the stuff. guy who's bought that, yeah, thousands of dollars worth of headstock, and you're and you think it's all lost, this video's for you. That's right. You've got your chance. If you follow us clearly, you know you should be fine. Just follow all of our series. Yeah, you know, uh, especially the next section, we're going to go into details on exactly what you need to do to rebuild this model of headstock. Yep. You know, just pay really close attention, and if you do. We feel that anybody with the proper tools and equipment can definitely rebuild this headstock. And a little patience. Yeah, and just a little patience. That's key, right? Okay. And um, anything? Oh, yeah. Just while, um, before we proceed, we just want to ensure uh, that everybody has watched Part 3A. That's right. Yeah, Part 3A, at least. Yeah, at least. Part 3A does a lot of this, the small details, tools, materials, and the greasing and all that that we are not going to cover here. But we covered it in great detail, though. Yeah, because even the even though the title of the video is fo focused on the eleven accessory spindle, it's still the a lot of the procedures like greasing the bearings yeah. you mentioned still are are identical to this headstock and all of all of eleven spindles. That's right. So so definitely so if you haven't already done so, watch that first, and then come back and continue with uh, section one. You'll be in a lot better shape. Yeah. Great. Okay, we'll be back. Part 3D, Section 1, Procedure for Flange Style Bearings. Well, now this is going to be exciting because there's nothing that fires me up more than knowing we can do, we have done something and we're going to be able to share it on this on this uh, video here Yeah. of something we were told cannot be done. But that doesn't mean <laughs> right. it's easy. There's a reason why they can't be done. We've found the workaround that's perfected, but that was because we perfected it. So if you pay really close attention, you too can do what we've done, and that say that's save one of these headstocks. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, if you're going to be performing this procedure, yeah, pay special attention to what we're going to show you. Yeah, we mean well, but we yeah. but we need you to understand. You got to pay a really good. You got to really pay a lot of attention to this, and it can be done because we've done it. That's right. Okay. You know what I'd like to do is I'd like to first show what the problem is. Okay, you know, okay, we've already told you guys they don't make the flange style bearings for the angular contact bearings. So why won't your common style angular contact bearings work? Okay, what I'm going to show you is 
Um, and I'll go into more details just shortly. Okay, but I have the original bearings in front of me right here. Okay, these are the set, you know, the pair of angular contact bearings. And you can see, okay, one of the bearings is your normal bearing. Okay. Okay. The second one you'll notice has a flange. It's identical. These two are identical in every aspect, but this one has a flange. Yeah, it's got a flange and a groove. It's really quite sophisticated. Yeah. Okay, it really is. And these were made by New Departure. No other manufacturer made these. Wow. See, and that's why when New Departure discontinued this part, no other manufacturer had made them. And that forced Levin's hand. Yeah, and that forced Levin's hand, okay. exactly. And that's why they had to redesign the headstock. Okay, and then basically this one's the deep groove precision bearing that sits ah, in the rear of the sure. spindle. So just like this on the spindle. Okay, so if we look at this, so basically, uh, if you notice, see the flange bearing sits in just like that. Okay, nice. so just imagine, okay, so this one's right next to it in the back. Sure. This one's in front. Because it's a pair. Exactly. Okay, then we got the bearing cap. See, the bearing cap goes right here. And see, with this installed or fastened to the headstock housing, what happens is, because that flange being held in right here, it keeps this shaft, this uh, spindle shaft, from moving. You know, for moving oh, yeah. in this direction. That's what this is all about. Exactly. Because we couldn't fit that snap ring in. There was no way to do that. That's so. right. See, if you if you if you notice, if we were just let me get this one out, if I can. See, if we were if we were to install just your common style angular contact bearings. So let's say this was your front bearing. See, if we were to install this, this one, without the flange, it would go right through the spindle. It would spindle. just shoot right out the back of it. Yeah, just go right through the <laughs> spindle. Exactly. So, you know, it wouldn't go this way because it would be held in, you know, by the bearing cap. So it wouldn't go this way, but it would definitely go through the back. Oh, yeah, it would do that pretty quick <laughs> since all of our pressure is probably inward. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so you think, okay... Okay, so now you know what the problem is. Okay, so what's the solution? The first solution, which we mentioned in the prior section, was, okay, why don't you just add a retainer clip? Machine a groove and put that in there. Yeah, you would machine a groove right here in the rear. Replicating you know, that open style headstock design. Exactly. Precisely. And then that way, you know, you'd have the retainer ring on this side, the bearing cap on that side, and then that would lock in the pair of nice. contact bearings. And it would be quite nice. Yeah, so again, this would be very secure nice so nice okay but we couldn't do that because unfortunately when we did the uh, measurements there's not enough material back here you know to make the groove because even though this is a flat style headstock it's the old style design cavity inside that's right so if you notice they don't do anymore see how they board this for the bearing the sure. two bearing pair and then there's this large cavity on the inside yeah, it's huge. See, as you can see, let me see. Yeah, see, just like that. See that large cavity? Okay, so that's the problem. So our solution was uh, to take a normal bearing like this and then machine a groove. Okay, and let me just show that real quickly. Just to kind of, kind of see how the modified bearing looks like. Okay, so this is a, this is a bearing that we've opened up We've modified it and then we've resealed it in the bag. Yeah. Okay. And as you can see, see, we machined a groove. So it looked just like this bearing. See? So we machined that groove right there. And obviously, again, we want to reiterate, we used a, a hardened precision instrument lathe. Yes. Very critical. Yeah. With we a can't six. use one of those import lathes here, and you had to have that six jaw chuck for that very reason. It. Look at the depth of that cut we had to make. Yeah, to it's get very that ring in there. Very deep, and this is very hard. That's, so it's really and, an aggressive, a hard turn. So it's really aggressive. Yeah, and this groove's got to be precisionally cut. Yeah. You know, so that's why you need that larger lathe for that rigidity. Okay. If you notice, we've also so after we machine the groove, then we put this retainer clip in place. So basically, what we've done is we've as as close as possible, we've emulated this flange bearing. See, so now what we can do is, now we can install this just like the flange bearing, and see, this clip is going to ride just right here. Okay? Okay, but really important 
is when you, if you're gonna do this procedure, really important uh, when you shop for the the retainer clips, you're gonna notice there's a lot. Even in addition to these shown here, there's a lot more styles. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've it, seen a lot yeah, of them too. It'll, it'll Every be, industry has one different one. <laughs> exactly. And really critical is this is a style you're gonna need. The styles uh, X A N. It retains a full diameter low profile without the high points on. Right. See, because a lot of the other, like here, see, here's here's an external retainer ring, but see, you can't have you can, see. They added these holes to where you can use snap those ring plier, snap yeah. ring pliers, but you can't use these because see, really important when you shop for this, you also got to watch out for your outside diameter of the retainer clip because. Um, See, when this, when this was installed, you got these fastener holes that you're going to have to deal with. See, and see, this this diameter we selected just barely just... just sits right just on sits, that flange. Yeah, it just sits right there on that flange. A little lip, yeah, a little. And those and, are the... Oh, go ahead. Oh, and I was... And that cover, that cover sits flat on here? Oh, yeah, that's an that's a important point is... Okay, so these fasteners are used to hold, you know, this uh, bearing cap in place. Okay. So that's what's really critical. You know, if you use a retaining clip that's the diameter is too large, then you're going to have to file so notches. To, it has to fit there. That fit there, and while you know making sure you've got room for the fasteners, and you don't want to do that. You don't want to use a larger retaining clip and start filing these little notches. No, just just try to find the right retainer clip. Okay, so here let me um let me show some drawings just so people can get a bit better picture. Okay. Okay, this is the design uh yeah. Yeah, with the open cavity. Yeah, see the open cavity I showed you earlier on our headstock? And so you can see the flange right here on sure. see only on this bearing. See, so as you can notice, see there's nothing behind here to hold this bearing. See, it's just an open cavity. Wow. So so that's why this design requires the flange style bearing. Okay. See, but then when they redesigned the headstock, you notice they reduced the cavity, plus they've added a step. Well, they sure did. See? They locked that they locked that bearing in, see. Right. So now what they've done is, see, you'll notice the bearing has no flange anymore. So they're just using a pair of your regular common style angular contact bearings. And then, so they've added a step here to hold the bearing set from moving this way. And then you've got the bearing cap on the other side that keeps it from moving, you know, So you got forward. your tension. So. Yes, yeah, so you got your, your tension. So it's locking that bearing pair right in place, which is locking the spindle shaft in place. Oh, okay. See, so that's the new design and that's how they resolved it. Okay. So when we bought our headstock, we thought we bought this design. Because this is what we have and what we knew. Yeah, <laughs> few exactly. Of those. Yeah. <laughs> so now you understand what, the, you know, so, okay. Okay, and then I also did a, there's also going to be a couple of these drawings available for download. Okay. Okay, these aren't final. Um, I That's just. Preliminaries. Yeah, these are preliminary. I just did these drawings this week when we did this, uh, recorded this uh, video. Okay. This basically shows you, you know, gives you some notes on and some dimensions. Yeah, because we groove. didn't do these when we did the bearing installation for our friend. That's right. See, remember, when we, we just did a piece of paper. We're working it out the numbers, and we just machined and made it work. You know. Yeah, when we did this job initially, remember, we did this 12, 14 yeah. years ago, and we didn't, we didn't have solid works or anything. No. Yeah, we just did it. <laughs> we just, you know, on scratch paper, just scratched up the, you know, old school draft. The, you know, <laughs> yeah, the real quick draft manual drawing. And um, and we were successful, but oh, yeah. for this video, I actually want to do some nice drawings that people people can download. I yeah, a little better be help for you to do this on your own. You're, you're gonna you know, we're gonna need all the help you can get, like we yeah. wish we had. Exactly. So now you have it. Okay, so this is the groove you have to make in the bearing. Okay. Okay, we have abruptly left the workshop little bench where we've been sitting with you and sharing with you, and decided it's probably more important at this point to take you to a little bit more of a classroom setting at a whiteboard where Patrick's gonna give you more finite details about this critical operation that you're about to undertake.
Yeah. Hey, Patrick. Hi. Yeah, because we thought this was this would be really important for you to understand why we need to make uh, a modification to the eleven bearing cap because you know there's no errors. You know, once you machine the bearing cap, you, there, there's no second or third going. You have to get it done the first time. So uh, why don't we go over here first and take a look at the eleven drawing? Ooh. Okay. Okay, this is the drawing of the the early model 11 close style headstock. That yeah, I see the open cavity up there. Yeah, see the open cavity and see, you notice these are the two angular contact bearings and you can see the flange right here. And see, and then there, there's no step in the back. So this design's really depending on that flange to hold those that pair in place. So that way we have no axial movement of the spindle. Clear as a bell. Yeah, okay. So what I've done is I've quickly drawn the main component here. So, you know, we've got our main headstock, we've got the bearing uh, bore, and I just drew one of the bearings. And that's the original bearing you're drawing there, huh? That's right. This is the original bearing with the flange, and then this is the bearing cap. Okay. And I first want to show you how the, the old design with the flange bearing works. So if we look at this, Okay, let's look at the contact points on the bearing that's holding this, you know, assembly in place. Okay, so on this, on the left side of the flange, we've got this contact area in red. Okay, so that flange is sitting on, you know, in, on that headstock front. So that way, the spin, it's holding the spindle from falling through, you know, to yeah, the Yeah, I can see that's going to hold up on there. Okay. And then on the other side, on the right side of the flange and on the outside bearing race, we've got that contact area resting on the bearing cap. So it's holding in that bearing so the spindle won't go the other way. Oh, I see. It's see? grooved out just enough to squeeze it in there, huh? Exactly. It probably puts a little pressure even. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so let's make a modification to the bottom. Since so, we can't buy this thing. That's right. Okay so, <laughs> okay, so the bearing you buy today looks like that. You know, there's no flange or anything. It's just straight. Okay, obviously, see, we can't use it, uh, the bearing, a new bearing like this as is, because, see, there's nothing to hold this from moving in. It turns into a missile launcher. Right. If you would assemble your spindle this way, the spindle is just going to fall right through the back. So what we need to do is, as we explained earlier, we need to make a little groove and then add a retainer ring right here. See? Oh yeah. Okay, but there's a problem. Let me show you. I have the original flange bearing with me right here. Okay. So as you can see, so we've got our flange. Okay, and let me just give you the, the dimensions of this bearing. Okay, the outside dimension of the bearing race is 40 millimeters. Okay, then the outside diameter of the flange is 43.2 millimeters. Okay. Okay, so let me write that real quick. So, so that flange is 42.3 millimeters. Okay, the problem is, is when we went shopping for the retainer rings, we tried to get the smallest diameter we could find. Because, you know, we, one of the things we told you was, you know, you have, you really have to, there, there's a maximum diameter you have to go with because we've got the screws right here, the fasteners. See, so we've got the threaded holes right here. Yep. And then we've got the fastener on this side. See, so we, we have a limit on the size of the retainer ring, but we searched everywhere. We did extensive searching on this retainer ring, and the smallest ring we could find is about 42.8 millimeter. See, mm -hmm. so it's a little larger, and that creates a problem because if you look at the original design, see that recess in the bearing cap is just large enough to hold that flange in place. Yeah. See, but with the retainer ring, see, I drew it in a little larger, which it would be. Sure. But if you notice, it will no longer fit in that recess in the mm, bearing cap. No, it's going to get pinched in between that headstock and that cap. Exactly. So what's going to happen is your only contact area is going to be right here. And that's a bad thing. You know, it's very, and we're talking on each side, you know, we're talking like total, 
Yeah, three. So we're talking 50, um, a half a mil. So on each side, we're talking 20.25 millimeters. Very tiny. So it's not a, you, you wouldn't want to assemble a headstock like this. Oh, no. So not, there's not enough or, yeah, no. Yeah, not enough. And so what we need to do is we need to enlarge this recess right here. So here, let me draw it. So we need to do is enlarge the recess. So that way this can go over the retainer clip and then our contact area. Well, that's going to be close, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. See, then the contact area is going to be on the outside bearing race. See, because we really don't need, uh, so if you look at here on the old design, we've got the contact area on the outside bearing race and the flange, but with the retainer clip, it's only going to be on the outside bearing race. But that is fine because even on Levin's new, you know, new model design, that's how it works, just on the outside bearing race. So we're not compromising any bearing quality. No. So, so that's, so that, so that's the mission is, is that's the modification we have to make to the bearing cap is enlarging that recess. So well, how we're gonna accomplish that is we're gonna make a fixture on the lathe and with that fixture, that's how we're gonna hold the bearing cap. But we're, what we're gonna share later though is that fixture is gonna ha actually provide two operations for us or two, it's gonna, you know, give us two options. So, so, um, so it's a very valuable fixture. So not only is a fixture gonna allow us to hold the bearing a cap which to, we have to do you have to have do. to yeah this you have to do but in the future if the front of your bearing rate or bearing cap is damaged uh what we're going to do is we're just going to take a light surface cut so a face cut on the front just to clean it up just for cosmetic purposes and what's really nice is with that same fixture all we need to do is just uh just reverse the bearing cap and it'll just mount reversed and then we can take it over to the lathe and do our fine face turning operation. Yeah, that'd be nice. Then we'll have yeah. it forever anyway. Then that two uses out of one tool will be handy. That's right. So, okay, so I hope that's more clear. We thought this, this would be really important. This is like a nice little educational pullout from our already very detailed sit downs with you guys and the overhead shots and all that. It really is. So, okay, so that's it. So uh, let's go head back to the table. All right. Okay, we're back from that little schoolroom uh, whiteboard activity there with Patrick, and uh, let's see how we're doing. Yeah, okay. You know that fixture I was talking about that's going to be used to hold the bearing cap? Yeah. Well, I thought I'd show you a quick view of the drawing. Okay, we will go into this in more detail shortly, okay. but just kind of give you a quick view of what I'm talking about. See, if you notice, uh, we're going to actually make it out of 6061 aluminum, and we're actually going to... I think um, you need at least, we, we calculated that you're, you're going to need at least a two and a quarter inch bar. Um, but we're... And I think our inventory, we only had a two and a two half. Two and a half, We don't right. usually have big bar around no. here. No. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't stock big bar. We just happen to have that. Yeah. But at minimum, you need two and a quarter. Yeah. Okay. And really simple. Uh, it's a really simple part. Yeah, as you can see, you just need to face both ends. And there's, there's going to be this cylinder that we're going to machine. And then if I bring the bearing cap over, so this is the, this is looking at the top view of this sure. fixture. So see with that cylinder, we're oh, going to be okay. able to drop this right into place and this will center it and provide, you know. And we just spin it to fit the holes and screw them in. Yeah. See, we're going to, um, we're going to drill and tap three 632 threaded holes yeah, and then right. that's going to hold it. And there's not going to be much pressure on the screws because you know this is going to take much of the force okay. and it's going to keep it centered and the screws are just going to keep it from turning. Oh great. So that's why you know although we could do six fasteners oh, yeah. we really don't know where's it three. going. Right. Hey, say you know that's a pretty neat uh blueprint. It, it do they know <laughs> can I make sure they understand this is a good time for them probably right to go ahead and go to activeadam.com and download that document. Oh sure yeah we are making this available. Yeah. That's that's really So yeah, they made good the blueprint point. for you you just have to make the tool. Yeah. And um, yeah, if like, we keep repeating it, but uh, just so you know, you can go to activeatom.com and we have a special section and we'll put a link under the description as yeah. well. But it's a section devoted 
to this series, which is the spindle rebuilding series. Yeah, all your materials, all your tools, all That's your right. all your blueprints needed to make anything all that we're the sharing is all, all the there. documentation, drawings, everything, including. We this took drawing. all the time so you wouldn't have to. We hope it's helpful. Yeah. So yeah, so no, that's I'm glad you mentioned that because oh, that way they don't have to take notes. You can just download this and it'll be a PDF. Oh great. Okay. Um anything else? Yeah, well, yeah. I was almost not gonna remember, and here I am bragging about how we cover everything. <laughs> Can I borrow that bearing over there? I need to I need to explain something about how how are you gonna machine that race into that race like that with that groove for that retainer? Oh, I know you what know. you're gonna say. Because yeah, <laughs> no, I forgot. Move over here. Okay, good. Right. Okay, the reason why I forgot because Lance was the one who did this. Okay, before we machine this bearing, okay, this is the old flange bearing, but when you unpackage the new bearing where you're gonna machine the groove. Right, I'm not allowed to have it yet because we're not ready to use it, so. That's right. See, you don't wanna take a bearing like this, open like this on the lathe and start, you know, modifying it or turning your groove. No, not when I'm over here using protocol on it to keep every little piece of lint out. We certainly don't want chips from the yeah. lathe in there. Yeah, because if chips go into the, you know, bearing cage, Ouch. that's a really bad thing because we feel that you can't adequately clean a no, bearing. No, you're not. They're going to be, it's, it's, it's too risky. It's too risky on a super precision bearing. So how do we get around that, we asked. Okay. Yeah, so what Lance did was, or why don't you explain oh, the sure. process That's since you're the one who did it. Oh, yeah. Well, what I did was, using Patrick's favorite isopropyl. Good stuff. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not allowed to use acetone because I'm afraid of the retainer. So right, okay, because that's that resin, and I don't right. It's a phenolic resin, right? Yeah, so so not, I stay with Nastro still too hard. I don't need it. We just I just use that isopropyl without not a paper towel now. Oh yeah, yeah, use, Patrick. Use okay, very important. Yeah, don't use a paper towel. It's, it has too much lint. So what we personally use we use these Kim wipes, which are lint free. Yeah. Or you could use a hundred percent cotton t-shirt material that's been washed already. So it has no lint on it. Yeah, no lint. And that and should be fine. We just put the isopropyl, just get these cleaned off really good. Mask this surface completely here. Just mask it right on off. Sure. And uh, and then it's not so bad. Of course, I do a lot of masking for paint around here, so it's easier on me. Right. And I do the same thing over here, just isopropyl and that tape on here. Now, when you're all done machining this thing and it's been spinning at them RPMs and all that, that tape been wearing on there, the best thing to do when you take the tape off is again, come back with your isopropyl again. This is all before greasing now. Right, before greasing, yeah. Yeah, I don't want any grease because that's like a <laughs> magnet. I mean, there's already grease here, so I don't need to add to the magnet at this time. And I'm just going to have you isopropyl the possible tape residue back off of here. Right. And then, so remove your tape, isopropyl here, and then I believe at that time, if you just use your rotocol and whatever else you would need to use to get any possible leather lint you see in here off, chip any possible chip that might have got under, whatever, and then it's time for greasing. That's right. Now you're ready. Oh, really important. And don't use like painter's tape or masking tape because it's not, it's, it doesn't have the adhesive to really stay on. Because what, what you don't want is to tape it and have it come off in the middle of machining. Well, yeah, because of the RPMs. Right. So use a good quality tape. Yeah. Very important. And you'll, and you'll be fine. And I think that's... That's all. I just wanted to catch that in there just because, you know, here we are preaching about cleanliness. That's true, yeah. That's all the, it's the only way you can handle it. It's the only way it can be done. I can't take the thing apart. Or no, wood. no. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. That's so important. There you go. Okay. Okay, so great. I think that finishes off this section. And I think the next step is to actually do the, we're going to machine the fixture. And then once the fixture is completed, then we're going to make the modification to the bearing cap. So we get to share some fun machining. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, a little bit of that's fun runs along the way. Yeah, okay, great. 3D, section two, machining fixture and bearing cap. Oh boy, <laughs> I see the word machining and I do get a little excited. That means we're probably heading out to the machine shop shortly. Yes, finally. Not bad. Okay, at this stage, if you haven't already done so, this is the time where you're gonna wanna modify your angular contact bearing. And that's, you know, machining the groove and then adding on the retainer ring. Okay, unfortunately, that's a operation that we can't show because, as we mentioned earlier, we already have that bearing because we made yeah. two sets when we did one for a friend. A guy long, made a long time, time ago, ago yeah, over 10 years ago. It, so, it finally paid off to do two sets. <laughs> yeah, we did, we did a second as a backup. And fortunately, we were able to keep the backup set 
So, which we thought we'd never use, so it's really nice for us. That's but right. but we are going to provide, remember, we are going to make the drawings available on the it'll, exact... It'll tell you exactly how to do it if you follow that blueprint. That's right. Yeah. Just follow the blueprint and the instructions and you should be fine. You will be. Okay. And our little masking instructions. That's right, yeah. the masking instructions. So, okay, but we are going to go to the machine shop and we are going to show you how we're going to machine the fixture. Yeah. And then once we machine the fixture, then we're going to show you how we're going to attach the bearing cap to it. Yeah. And then we're going to enlarge the recess, you know, for the to make room for the retainer ring. Yeah. It's okay. a close it's a close fit, but yeah, it'll be it's fun. A, yeah, it'll be fun. Okay. So that's the first operation we're going to do on the re, on the bearing cap. Now, in our case, we had another problem, didn't we? Yeah, or this okay. We to do. The second operation we're going to do on it is optional. You know, you may or may not want to do this. But since you have, since since you're gonna make this fixture, this fixture is gonna actually provide an additional feature. Yeah, it's and designed to do it. Yeah, it's gonna allow you to flip the bearing cover, and then you know fasten it. And then what we're gonna do is, because our the front of our bearing cap it has damage, you know. Not caused here. Yeah, not caused. <laughs> and it's, it's just all okay, fun. maybe a little. And it's cosmetic. It's over time. Yeah, it's over time. You know, you bump into it. No, we have to look at it. it. When you run 11, you're always like this. So you have to look at it. So, right. So we just want it cosmetically uh, aesthetic. And, and all we're going to do is we're just going to take a really light face cut on, yeah. on the lathe. But over gonna, there. But we're going to use the same fixture. And you might have the same problem. Yeah. So we thought, well, if we're going to do it, we might as well share it. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. So um, I think we'll head out to the machine shop. Aha, I love that part. Great. We'll see you there. Okay, well, welcome out to the machine shop. We're going to go over just a couple of things Patrick's going to perform on the machine right now. So let's take a look at what's happening. Yes, we're out here and what we're going to focus on first is we're going to be making the fixture we talk about. And the fixture is what's going to hold our bearing cap. So what I did was I found a two and a half inch diameter 6061 aluminum. And this is what we're going to make the fixture out of. And although um, this is a two and a half inch bar, you can use as small as two and a quarter. Well, that's helpful. Yeah. So anything larger than two and a quarter is fine. Okay. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to saw cut a little piece uh, just so I can chuck it better in the lathe. And then this is the part we're actually going to make. So um, really easy part. Um, nothing really to it. Um, basically, the first the first uh, step is to just do a face cut. You know, we just want to start with a good flat, clean surface, good. and then uh, we're, we want to turn this cylinder. And so you can see this is the top view of our fixture. And with the cylinder, the purpose of it is it's gonna the bearing cap is gonna drop right inside, just like that. Okay. So it's gonna. It's gonna ensure that the bearing cap is precisely centered, but it's also gonna support it while we do the machining. Yeah, we don't want anything moving around. Yeah, because if you notice, we are gonna have three screws right here. They're little holes they are too. Yeah, they're just 632 threaded screws. Oh, imperial. And, yeah, imperial. Because remember, on all 11 uh, lathe, you know, accessories and lathes and machines, Everything's imperial.
Okay, hey, look, real quick, we've caught up with Patrick. He's doing a little bit of uh, bolt head detail work, and he's going to explain a little bit about what's what's occurred here as he's making that, getting those parts ready. Yeah, because we thought this would be really important to share because we actually didn't anticipate this. And let me show you, actually, let me show you the fixture. Let me grab it over here. Okay, this went really well. You know, I did the, I used the transfer punts, I drilled the three holes, tapped them, went perfect. But the problem was when I went to mount the bearing cap, because the operate, because remember, we have two operations we're going to be doing. We're going to do the operation where we're going to clean up the front of the bearing cap by just doing a light that, surface. That cosmetic one. Yeah, the cosmetic okay. one. So we're going to do that first. Okay, once I'm done with that operation, then I'm going to remove it, flip it, and then we're going to do the second operation where we're going to enlarge the recess. And that's for so we can accommodate the bearing with the retainer ring. Oh, yeah, a little obstruction okay. problem. Yeah. So, and that's why we haven't run into this before because this is actually the first time we're mounting the bearing cap on a fixture for cosmetic purposes. So, and we thought we'd share this because when I mounted the bearing cap uh, cover, um, I realized when we placed the fasteners in, uh, the fastener is too high. So it actually is the same height as the bearing cap uh, cover. So what happens is if I would leave them as is, when I do the surface cut, the lathe cutter would be hitting the screw heads. Oh, yeah. and we really don't want that. You know, especially when we're cutting for cosmetic purposes, I don't want that cutter to be hitting the hardened yes, screw heads. Yes, step-offs and jumps, yeah. That's right. So what, is, what I decided to do is come over to the bench grinder, and I've already done one. So basically, I'm just holding, you know, these screws in a WW, call it, pin vise. And I've already done one just to show you the difference. Okay. Is that good? Got it right there, yep. See? And I'm not taking that much, just a little bit. All right, because obviously you don't want to go too deep because then you're going to lose, you know, your socket head, uh, the space in there because you won't have any room left for the Allen wrench. <laughs> and believe me, that's from experience. <laughs> so, and you only need to, because remember, we're only doing a really light surface cut for cosmetic purposes. So we aren't going to be removing that much material or we don't intend to. So we thought we would share that because, you know, if you're going to be doing this operation for cosmetic purposes, uh, you definitely want to bring the, the heads down because you don't want to cut them. Perfect. Okay, okay well now we know why you're over here. Great. We're back over here. We just completed the first operation of the cosmetic finish, and now we're moving on to the clearance finish. But we've stopped right here to share the results and share what we're going to do next. Yeah, as you saw in the video, the operation went really smoothly, and the results were extremely happy with them. Look Ooh, at that. Ooh, it's an official Levin and Son factory finish replaced. Yeah, doesn't that <laughs> look nice compared to before? Yeah, and good thing they don't have a patent on that finish. <laughs> and remember, just a reminder, you know, we didn't want to machine the end, this up. We don't want to machine where the slinger cap sits on because we don't want to change that position. So you won't see this part. So that's why you still see the damage right there. But just look at the difference. Remember this damage right here was here as well. Oh, so yeah. it cleaned up nicely. The slinger cover look is clean, so it'll just blend right over there and look great. That's right, it's gonna look perfect. 
So great. So 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 uh, the first operation's completed. So now the second operation, we're gonna flip it, and and using the same fixture. Oh yeah. See just like that, and see for the second operation, this is where we're gonna enlarge this recess uh, to allow for the additional room. Uh, for the retainer ring. Okay. The retainer ring's a little, just a tad larger than the the diameter of the flange on the old bearing. Yeah, and it doesn't let it sit flat. It doesn't let it get up there and try to get toward a flusher fit and it's stuck on the ring. That's right. Okay. But you'll notice is where uh, we actually need to use a screw that's a little longer. Okay. Because, you know, obviously we don't, we don't have the countersinks on the back. Oh, yeah. And your cap's upside down and all that. Exactly. So that's fine, but one of the things uh, we also need to do for this operation is we're going to have to modify the socket head. And let me show you, but we modify it in a different way. So here, let me, okay, there we go. Okay, if you'll notice, okay, the socket head cap screw as is you'll see it's interfering with the recess right here. Oh, it sure would. See, if I didn't, if we don't modify these to bring down the diameter of the head, when we enlarge the recess, that lathe cutter is gonna hit every screw. Oh, yeah. And again, we don't wanna do that because these screws are hardened and it's just a bad thing to do. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these three screws, we're gonna go back into the workshop and on our little mini lathe, uh, we're going to reduce the diameter of these heads. And I think we'll take you along and show you how we do okay. that. And we'll share all the diameter results and everything so you'll be able to know what we're doing. That's what right. What we've done so you can follow. Yeah. Yeah. And just to let you know, uh, we will be sharing the drawings for like this fixture as well. So you'll be able to download this as well, which will give you all the dimensions for this fixture. Well, that'll make life a lot easier yeah. for you. Great. Okay. So I'll see you in the workshop. We're in the workshop now and we're at that little mini lathe so uh patrick what are we about to see here okay yeah we're at our little tiny mini lathe here and i've already done one just to give you an example of how it should look see the difference see this is the original oh, socket yeah. head cap screw and this is the one that's been turned down and we're gonna have to do three of these huh yeah and i just want to show you the difference okay see how that's interfering uh if we were to leave use these it would interfere with our cutter oh yeah and see now you can see that it has you know the gap right there so quite a bit yeah. yeah quite a bit so it's going to be perfect it, we won't interfere with it with our cutter so you started with what about a quarter inch there you're saying and yeah the diameter of this uh, out of the box is about a quarter inch diameter and we brought it down to about 150 thousandths of an inch. Okay, still plenty of a head to hold it there. Yeah, so, no we, so we took off about, what, 70 thousandths? Yeah. Yeah, it's not much. Okay, and this is how we do it. Um, you know, we use a little tiny mini lathe, and I, I'm using a little collet chuck. Oh, look at that little baby collet. What is that? Oh, uh, this uses ER-16 collets. Yeah, it's just going huge to hold that giant bolt there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what people may remember, I just thought about this, is we actually did a very similar operation where we had to do the same thing on socket head cap screws. Oh, we sure did. And that's when we were restoring our... Um, the micro drill or the... No, we were restoring all the different... Uh, chucks for our leaven lathes and the watchmaker lathes. Oh, and we had to turn the heads down. Yeah, all the three jaw, four jaw chucks and and um, on the leaven chucks, uh, we had to replace the socket head cap screws and in order for them to fit, we had to um, turn them down. But what's really interesting is the factory actually turns them down. <laughs> so yeah, to customize them. So that was really interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm just using a carbide cutter, a micro grain cutter. And I'll just show you. I'll just show you one pass. Let me do 
one more pass, huh? That's all to it. Oh, okay. Well, that was neat. We'll see you when we get all three of them done then. Okay, great. We'll, we'll go back to the machine shop when Gr we're done. All right. Okay. Bye. Okay, that operation looked like it went pretty smooth. It's nice to see this coming to a closure here. How, how did it come along, Patrick? Yeah, you know what? As you saw, it went really smooth. You know, you just have to get over making the fixture and, you know, we had to modify the screw heads. But it, once you do that, the actual operation of, you know, increasing diameter of the recess goes really smoothly. What? I only had to take a few passes. Oh yeah, you didn't even get close to those screw heads. See, you had plenty of room. Oh yeah, see, I left it in here because I want to show you how it looks, yeah, you know, nice. with all three screws and after the operation. Oh yeah, nice clean, didn't hit anything, everything was nice. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, and even uh, it cut really smooth and really nice, gave a really good finish. Now you have a nice future tool for, for additional builds in the future for that, that part of the project. Yeah, and remember, you know, when you make this fixture, it serves two purposes. You know, it serves the modification you know, of your bearing cap, but also in the future, at any time, you could always, you know, you don't have to rebuild your spindle just to remove the bearing cap and, you know, do a light surface cut on it to clean it up for cosmetic purposes. So, and you can do that any time. So the fixture, yeah, it's a pain to make and all that, but you know what, you can use it any time. That's pretty nice. Yeah, so I guess the next step is, um, it looks good. Uh, I took off, let's see, the original size was about 43.2 millimeter. Oh, okay. And then I took, okay, and then I took it to about 43.85 millimeter because the retainer ring itself is just slightly under that, which is about 43.82. So I took the diameter of the retainer ring and I just, I just added a little bit just to allow for a little room. Oh, okay. And and, but remember, you know, all we're doing is we really, we're just adding clearance so that way it doesn't touch the retainer ring. So that way it it's free the in there. Wall. Right, it's free. free. The, it's just supported by the wall. That's exactly. it. Exactly. So it can never open up, that's for sure. No. <laughs> that's a so, good feeling. Yeah, so that closes up this section. So we'll be back in the workshop and when we'll do a parts review. Oh, great. It's time to get moving forward here. Absolutely. Hey. Part 3D, Section 3, Parts Review. And I might add, what a beautiful looking smorgasbord. If you're hungry and like <laughs> building models, this looks like one of those fancy model kits. So come along and let's let Patrick explain all the parts and pieces he's got. Yeah, there are a lot of parts, aren't there? Oh yeah. It's hard to believe that all these parts make up the whole assembly of a headstock. As tiny as they are, and look at that beautiful paint job on that headstock. Yeah, more important than anything, be sure that your headstock housing is all clean and ready to go. Yeah, you, you should already have that done if you're at this stage. That's right. And especially the paint, too. If you plan on painting your headstock, that should have already been completed. Yeah, we dry. don't paint after. You paint before. Before, right. You're dealing with the micron. Yeah, really, really fine here. And the other important part, obviously, that should be ready is a spindle. And you should have the spindle ready with the witness marks already yeah. marked. All your high points. Yeah. That, where we've checked the high spots. Exactly. And um, 
And then, you know, you want to be sure that you have the witness marks on both ends just as a safeguard in case you accidentally rub one. Because they do, they do rub off. <laughs> they do. Yeah, and you don't want that. So, okay. Yeah, so uh, I think we're ready. Let's go over all the parts. And um, and the reason why we're doing this, the reason why this section is so important. It's more important than we lead on about. And we've made these errors ourselves. Yes. So this isn't, this isn't something new to you. This is something that's happened to us. Yes, because it's so easy just to take a quick look at all your parts and think, oh, we're ready to go. Yeah, it's all there. Close enough. Yeah. And see, that's the worst thing that can happen is be in the middle of an assembly. Like, let's say you're the, in the middle of putting on your bearings onto oh, the spindle. Boy. And then you realize, oh, God, I'm missing a part. I'm missing the bearing spacer or the locking collar. And you're like, and that's a really bad situation because now you're stuck. Your bearings are already greased at that point. That's right. You've already started that timer. That's right. It. Your bearings are greased. Your headstock's open. And, you know, and we don't want that situation. And now you either have to find that missing part. And if you can't find it, you're going to have to order a new one, make one. And, yeah, you just Yeah, don't... at this stage now, it's something that's a good point you just brought up. Mm -hmm. We've either bought reworked, remachined, mm, right. made new, or altered in some way every part on this table to get to this point, including the purchase of new, brand new fasteners. That's a great point, yeah. Not only should you have the part, all the parts should be in perfect, good this, this condition. Is, they, this needs to be their good to best day. Yeah. Right, okay, good, no. Of course, in our case, we've already done bluing and everything else. We wanna do cold bluing, got all of our parts cosmetically <laughs> perfect sure. too. And you know us, like we always mention, preach, we always use new fasteners. Oh, always. Yeah, there's no reason to use the the old fasteners. Always replace them. It's too cheap not to. So, okay, let's just go over this really quick. Um, okay, let's go over this part. Okay, this is okay. This is our bearing spacer and locking collar. Yeah, now that's different than the than the three C collar, isn't it? Three C, uh, yeah. 3C. Yeah, it is. When we did the three spindle, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, in part three C, we did the three C. <laughs> call I it know. Spindle. I call it. Call yeah. it. Call it. <laughs> and um, if you watch that video, you'll notice that in for that headstock, it's two separate parts. Completely separate. They do not attach. They're just separate. Yeah. Now let me just show you real quick where that's at. See, so you've got the you got the main spindle shaft. Yeah. So you got the pair of angler contact bearings. Sure do. Okay. So after we install the two bearings, then we install the bearing spacer, then the locking collar, and then deep groove bearing. But see on the 3C uh, call it headstock, these were two separate parts, yeah. the bearing spacer and the locking collar. But see, but on the... Well, I like this one better, and it's for one reason, if one reason only, other than it's attached. Yeah. Is I like that it has that keyway all the way down it to securely put it along the... Uh, yeah, this is what Lance the spindle is, shaft. See, this is what Lance is talking about. See, they actually machine it as two separate parts, mm -hmm. but then they key it and then put a, a retaining clip or what would you call it? A, a snap ring. Snap ring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But then on the inside, you'll notice you can use a really large key. And see, that's what we use. See, and on that bigger 3C call it, uh, spindle, it, it stops. See, only this one has the key. And this one didn't have the key. That's right. See, because... The, and you would think because it's the bigger spindle, it would have actually been the other way around. That's right. Just in theory. See, yeah. because a locking collar is a separate part in the 3C uh, headstock, it can only use a short little key. Yeah. Yeah. So we think this is better. Better approach. Okay. And then obviously we've got the key for it. Yeah. yeah make sure you always have all the little parts. Okay. Next, we have the spindle nut. Okay. And then we've got the fastener. Notice that... The fastener is already removed. Oh yeah. Okay. If, if you don't have that fastener removed, now's a good time to remove it. It's just a safeguard so that you don't actually accidentally have this inserted and tightened, and then you attempt to install the spindle nut. Because if you do that, uh, it it can damage the threads not yeah. only on the spindle nut, but you can damage the threads on the spindle Most shaft. Most importantly, the spindle shaft, and yeah. that's really expensive. And those those threads are just really. They're, they're tough, but they're delicate. They're small. They're some yeah, of the finest threads fine. we play with around here. Yeah, really fine. Easily damaged. Yeah, so just as a safeguard, we just remove it completely, and we recommend you do that, Yeah, too. so it goes on in a free state, and then we attach the uh, secondary locking mechanism. It feels, That's right. It just feels more secure to us. Exactly. Okay, then we've got the belt pulley. Oh, yeah. And then it uses a little tiny key. See? Because oh, yeah. it has a little keyway right there. So it uses a little key. 
Okay, then we got the bearing calf. Okay, notice uh, this, we've already cleaned it. <laughs> it's nice, see, we've now, as you saw in video, we took that uh, really... Uh, beat up. Yeah, it was a beat up. It was a really beat up surface. For, so for cosmetic reasons, we took a really light uh, face cut and cleaned it all up and it came out really nice. And you know, as you remember, this is our fixture. So this worked out really well. It did. Yeah, perfectly. And then so, oh, and then also, you know, we're able to enlarge the uh, recess. Oh, to accommodate that bearing ring. That's right. So that worked perfectly. Retainer ring. The retainer ring, right. Yeah. Okay, then we've got the slinger Zing. <laughs> that attaches to the head of the spindle shaft. Yeah. We got the slinger cap. Yeah. Okay, and notice we've got the fasteners, the fasteners for the, the six fasteners for the slinger cap and the six fasteners for the bearing cap. They're really nice when they're brand new. Yeah. Yeah, just perfectly clean. Okay, over here we've got the assembly for the locking, this is the locking yeah. plunger. Locking plunger here. Yeah, here, let me show Inside. you. See, this is the front of the uh, headstock housing and the locking plunger goes right here on the front. So when you want to lock the spindle, you push the plunger in and see, and this is the assembly. So you've got, you've got the pin that goes in like that. Okay, then you've got this plate that keeps the pin from being able to pull out. Yeah, it, it goes on the ball bearing and the spring pressure and it locks open or locks closed. And that's key. When you when you assemble this, we'll go over that, huh? That's we'll right. About how, how that needs to really be in a locked out or locked in position. So that's slip. right. But I'll show you real quick how it works. Yeah. See, so, you know, so this is on the spindle shaft. So if you want to lock it, so you push it when it's in one of these notches. I think there's six of them. Yeah, and there's six of yeah. them, and it locks in just like that. Right, and you can actually, uh, that's what you can use to, to uh, tighten your new collet in, right? That's right. I'm glad you mentioned that. Unlike the open style headstock where you have that really delicate uh, spindle lock pin, um, you know, that's so, the, the pin on that's so delicate, you don't want to use that to lock the spin, you know, to lock. This is the only one we recommend that with. Yeah. Uh, on, These uh, 3C, but uh, 3, yeah. Actually, for all the 11 close style headstocks, the WWD and 3C. We're fine. You're fine to use. When they designed the, the locking plung, plunger, they designed this assembly really heavy duty. So you can use this to lock the spindle when you install the spindle uh, nut. And we've talked to Levin, and Levin also does that when they assemble their headstocks. So it's, just, it's a procedure that even Levin uses. Now, even though we're per the factory all the time around here, and almost like museum quality per the factory specifications, <laughs> yeah. even though we actually use these machines, there's a red knob on that table. Oh, yeah, right. And that is not a Levin factory knob. and Or is it a Levin factory knob size? Yeah, this is... So, okay, this is the original block knob from Levin. If you notice, we've replaced it with a red knob that's just a little larger as well. And there's a reason why we decided to do that. We did that on both close style headstocks. And the reason being is we want a bigger knob for one, but we want it red just as kind of like as a warning because, you know, it's just a habit. When you're, when you're in the middle of, you know, you're using the lathe all day, you're changing a collet. Oh, yeah, go, 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 yeah, go, go, go. And you get in a rhythm. And yeah, so you lock the spindle, change the collet, yeah. and sometimes you forget to unlock the spindle. Well, that, that never happens here. <laughs> Not but, here. But, but I've heard and read stories about people leaving that engagement <laughs> and then turning on the spindle. Yeah, we've Is heard that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It and happens I'm, a lot, but not here. Yeah, so it's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But it's kind of nice that it's red, kind of like a, you know, like a warning. You know, don't forget to pull that, yeah. you know, pull that out before you hit that, you know, the speed control. Oh, yeah. You know, on the motor and start it, yeah. And now, you, lastly, you do have, just a little bit lastly, huh? Yeah. The actual hardware that locks this thing down to that beautiful bed. Yeah, this is, this is the clamping hardware that mounts on the bottom of the headstock right here. See, so you, you got these two bolts that go here and then the locking clamps that go right here. Yeah. And then you've got the springs. The springs go in first and they keep the clamps- Tension out. Tension yeah. out. Yeah. So that way when you loosen it, 
you know, the tension's out, so that way if you have to remove or adjust... It pushes it away from the bed and reduces so, the friction so exactly. you can slide it all that redundant damage to the That's fine right. uh, laid bed. There. That's right. And I'm telling you, this works extremely well. When, when this clamps down that headstock to the lathe bed, I mean, it doesn't move. It's not going anywhere. It's all, it becomes one. Yeah. That, lathe, that head and that, that bed are one. It really is. So, and it allows you to adjust it. You can, this allows you, it's not mounted like bolts down through the, through the bed now. See, you right. can carry them. You could move things if you needed to. Right, you can move it down the bed anywhere. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's pretty neat. Yeah, and the tailstock uses the same method. That's very similar, yeah. yeah very yeah. similar, yeah. And obviously the uh, 11 accessories as well. Okay, so I think, did I cover everything? Yeah, you know, I just want to point out on this, on this, tool if I may. Oh the fixture? Yeah. yeah. But not these three. But we did reuse the old screws to make to hold the, the cap on for the machine. Oh that's right. Uh, because the, we had to cut those tops down and all that. So the, we don't just throw things away always because we gotta use we, gotta, we might as well just use them just to mount that on there and do that surface finish. That's true, right. I just want to bring up that point we're not that wasteful. <laughs> right. We're resourceful and that's I don't want to ruin new bolts making them to do that. Exactly. Okay. That's true. Okay, so great. Part 3D, Section 4, Preparing Headstock for Spindle Assembly. And boy, isn't somebody looking sparkly and shiny today. I couldn't be prouder of her. Me either. It is ready to start the assembly process. Yeah, it is. It's okay. Beautiful. But you know what's nice about the 11 closed style headstocks? Is there's no preparation involved. Oh, you know, what yeah. we had, had to do for the 11 open style headstock. You mean like the snap ring and them doze ups, the bearing nut covers, the spindle. Yeah, the yeah. internal ones. Right, so there's. Really unique to that spindle. Yeah, just on the open style headstocks. Yeah. But fortunately, on the closed style headstocks, there is no preparation, but you want to ensure, you know, like we mentioned in the prior section, yes. just make sure it's all clean. Your you threads are all good, and if you're going to paint it, you should have already done that by now. That's right. We don't right. want to be doing that after this sophisticated work we're about to perform here. Exactly. So we're good to go. Yeah. Okay, so the next step is uh, now is the time to open your bearings, because as we've always preached, you don't want to open up your bearings until you're mm -hmm. ready to lubricate them. When I look at that <laughs> into that camera and tell you, no, 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 it's it's really because I've told myself that because I've done it. Yeah. I'm being honest. And oh, we're anxious, you know. We've so. been anxious in the past, and we don't break the rules anymore. Yeah. But <laughs> we're looking at ourselves when we're talking to you. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is... Off camera, I'm going to go ahead and open up the bearings. Good. I'm going to lubricate them. Right. But um, we aren't going to share that oh, on no. video because in, what was it? It was part 3A, hey. mm -hmm. which was for the Lev Levin accessory spindle. We went into great detail on using the syringes, you know, filling them up with the grease, using the special blunt tips. Oh, boy. And even under the microscope, we went to great detail on the application of the crease in the bearings. We did. And, yeah. and, and there's enough to do and enough you need to focus on doing that lubricating because what we don't want, and I know we reiterate a lot of things a lot of times, yeah, is we don't <laughs> want that bearing grease to cause that bearing to overheat during the break-in process. So, yeah. so what we're sharing with you is, is even for us, filming that is enough Doing the work's enough yeah. for us. Filming on top of it was quite a bit more. We only wanted yeah. to do that once, and it's really important that you go watch that because this this is all the details that make the difference between somebody who does something good and somebody who's fantastically great at what they do. Yeah, and you know what? And we want you to be great. Even if you've already watched Part 3A and you've watched that section, we highly recommend to go ahead and just watch it again. Yeah. And just right prior to doing this procedure. Because there's a lot of little finite details there that we take for granted. And that's the, right. want to make sure we just do the best to help you. Great. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and start the uh, grease application procedure. Great. And when I'm completed with that, we're going to come back and we're going to install the bearings onto the spindle shaft. Well, we're getting excited here. Great. Okay. Part 3D, Section 5, Installing Bearings Onto the Spindle. Well... I see something special going on under the gate cover over here. <laughs> yes, we've got the bearings, all three lubricated. And like you mentioned, we have them covered. And this is, a, we actually use these covers in watchmaking. You know, when we're, when we aren't working on a watch movement or we're working on another part, you know, we don't want to keep the watch movement or maybe some other parts just out in the open. 
So we always have a habit of keeping them covered, okay? But we like to take that same, you know, principle or that same habit over when we're doing a spindle rebuild because of bearings, especially when bearings have been lubricated, we don't want them sitting on the table with the risk of them gathering dust, foreign particles and all that. That's right. You know, because, you know, they, cause, you know once, once a part has grease or oil, it acts like a magnet, you know. So very important, okay? Um, yeah, okay, before we start the installation, why don't we talk about the few, maybe a couple of tools that are going to be needed and maybe a couple of supplies. And so the most important tool you're going to need for installing the bearings onto the spindle shaft is actually the tool, the proper tool to install the bearings. Okay, in our case, if you've seen um, mm -hmm. our prior videos, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll know that we use a tool from SKF and it's their bearing installation tool set. And Lance will show you uh, the main components to it. So here's the die. That this, uh, this particular die happens to work for these three bearings, both the, both this, the uh, angular contact pair and the deep groove bearing. That's so correct. One tool does all. In this particular case, it's not generally how it works. Yeah, because some, yeah, some headstocks, like the 3C headstock, the deep groove bearing was a different size from the angular contact bearing, so it required two different bearing dies. And this is my post. That's right, okay. So there's that. So we're gonna give him that. And we got an SKF dead blow hammer, which is pretty good. And a dead blow hammer is very important, like we've mentioned before. Yeah, regardless of who made it. Yeah, who makes it. We just don't want that ricochet. We don't, you don't that want rebound. that. That rebound, you yeah. don't want that rebound. You, and it, you just want that nice solid hit. You do. So very important. Okay, some other things is, um, at this stage, now that we're gonna be assembling parts, uh, every time we we assemble a particular part, we want to lubricate it. And what we want to lubricate it with is with a light weight, good quality machine oil. In our case, we use nye oil just because it's a really highly refined. Yeah, good, nye oil red. Yeah, it's yeah. great quality oil. So, and you don't want to do all the parts at once. That's one really important. Yeah, one at a time, only when you're ready to install it, because if we oil all the parts again, it's going to act all the parts. Or are... one set at a time if it happens to be yeah, the, maybe a set. the screw, the sure. screw threads or something. Yeah, because remember, once you lubricate or oil a part, it acts like a magnet for those particles and dust and all that. Okay. Okay, one of the things you may notice um, that we don't use paper towels. You don't see no. those blue paper towels that we're famous for using. Okay, and these are the Kim wipes. Uh, that we use they're you know they're almost like a cloth and and they're lint free so very crucial in this section when we're you know working with the bearings it's so crucial not to get any lint or anything even from paper towels we don't want any of that lint uh being attracted into the bearings that's true and all of these items and these materials these tools and these materials are listed at activeadam.com Oh, that's right, which is in the parts and supplies checkoff sheet. Yeah, they're pretty fancy. Yeah. A lot we, easier than making notes along with us talking over Exactly. Here. And it's a really nice checkoff. We call it a checkoff sheet because it's, it's a really thorough, detailed listing with descriptions of each item. And it talks about, you know, depending on what you're rebuilding, if you're going to need that particular tool or not. And so it's free. Yeah, <laughs> it's free, you know. And there's a lot of other nice documents and there even a, a, a form for the break-in procedure. That website's really going to grow a lot with a lot of very sophisticated documentation related to this project and many others over the years to come. Definitely. Okay. And lastly is you're going to need some type of a soft platform. Oh, uh, no way. <laughs> when you're installing the bearings. Okay. Because, you know, when we install the bearings, we're going to have the... Sh the spindle shaft sitting like this, and then we're gonna use the bearing insulation tool, you know, to press on the bearings. Okay, but we don't wanna rest the spindle like on your tabletop. It's too hard and you're gonna risk damaging your spindle. So we highly recommend is a hockey puck. Made in Canada. And this one's made in Canada. And it's the only Canadian made tool we actually have here that we've identified. So <laughs> it is. So we're kind of proud to have it. And the reason why we use a hockey puck because it just has a perfect characteristics or the perfect properties. That is vulcanized rubber. Yeah. And a it's a special Goodrear project. Yeah, and it's just, it's just soft enough, but not too soft. Yeah. Because you don't want something mushy either. So it's just but but it's also just soft enough that's not gonna damage the spindle. Oh yeah. So really important. Okay. And I know because I hold on to the stuff and it really works. 
Yeah. It really allows me a flat platform and it feels real soft though. It doesn't feel like it's going to hurt anything. That's right. And, and these are so popular. You can probably get these at any, you know, uh, sporting goods store or online. So very common part. Okay. And <laughs> Why? Not, not, not in the desert where we live, though. <laughs> no, Local. it's online. That's why I said online. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Oh, uh, I almost missed just, a, just oh. these are the last few things. Okay. You'll notice I'm wearing a loop. So, and because I wear eyeglasses, I have a loop that, you know, attaches to my eyeglasses. But you can also, you know, use this type of a loop, the more common type. Okay. But you're, um, you're going to need a loop. And then either a good set of tweezers or what we prefer, rotical. And rotical is... From the watchmaker's industry. Yeah, and it's like a putty. and It's like a cleaning putty. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. And what you're going to need this with the loop for is when we install a bearing, before we install it, we want to just take a really good look at it to be sure there's no particles, dust, lint, you know, hair, eyelash, anything. And then if we do f detect anything, you know, you'll either use your tweezers or the rotical, you know, to just dab it off. Oh, yeah. You know, so very important, you know, because you'll know, you'll see that once we get this assembly, you know, we once it starts getting assembled with the bearings and we install it into the headstock, you're never going to see the bearings again until you do another rebuild. So it's worth every second of time to, to do these little details. It's fine. Minute as they sound, they're actually yeah. about all about longevity. Definitely. And where, yeah. Okay, so we're ready to get started? We are, I cannot wait. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lubricate the spindle. Okay, generally we just want just a light coat. You know, uh, the primary purpose of this light coat of oil is more as a rust preventative. But in this case, for certain parts, especially moving parts, or in this case, we're installing the bearings onto the shaft. We'll just add a little bit extra uh, just to help with the installation of the bearing since it's really, it can be, you know, depending on the tolerances yeah. of the shaft and the bearings, it can either go on really smoothly or it can be really difficult, you know. That's true. Okay, this is how I start. Uh, when I do a spindle rebuild, I always place the spindle shaft where the witness marks are facing me. It's which just in a, this case are the high spots, right? Yeah, which is the high spot that we've measured on the spindle. Okay. okay. So, and it's just a good habit. It's just a habit I like to keep. Uh, just to keep keeps my mind that okay, the witness mark should always be pointing at me during this installation. Okay. So. I'll put it like that. Okay, let me grab the first bearing. Okay, the first bearing we want to install is going to be the angler contact bearing with the retainer ring. Okay. Okay, how these get installed, okay, remember, for angler contact bearings, we've got the bearing arrangement. You know, either front to front, back to back, and whatnot. Okay, on all 11 spindles, that's the accessory spindle, open style headstock, closed style head spot, headstock, uh, the arrangement is a back-to-back -back configuration. Okay, what that means is that means, okay, when you look at a bearing, you'll notice on one side you've got the print. Yes. On the other side, you've got no print. Well, the side that has the print is considered the back of the bearing. Okay. And where there's no print... It's just an easy way to know, you know, identify it. And no print means it's the front of the bearing. So the way we're going to install this is the first bearing is going to get installed with the print facing up. The second one's going to get installed with the print facing down. Okay. Okay. Now, does this bearing have the arrow on it? It does. This one does, huh? We got one. Yeah, Finally. see right there? <laughs> Yeah, because we, we, this is another thing we've mentioned. We mentioned um, on the smaller angler contact bearings, like the 7,000 ones that we install in the accessory spindle from Levin, you won't find the arrows. For some reason, the bearing manufacturers won't place the arrows in the smaller diameter bearings. It must be a difficult process at that smaller size. Yeah, 
But on the other bearings real quick, you will find these arrows. But again, not 100% because when we did the 3C uh, assembly, that's, that's, that's a 7,005 bearing, pretty large, you know, for the 3C spindle. And that didn't have the arrows. So it's not always guaranteed. So, but in this case, there's a 7,003 bearing. And I noticed that the arrow wide area is the back and it points to the back. That's right. So that's your back-to-back, -back, back matches your print claim. Exactly. I just want to point that out. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. A double chance. Sorry. And then always what I like to do is, is put a little bit of oil on the inside race. You know, again, this is just for assisting, you know, in the insertion of the bearing. Yeah, because it's going to be a little stiff. Hmm. Okay, since I have some extra lubrication, just put some on the outer race as well. Okay, here, let me do this. Okay, the next step is, this is where we use our loop. And this is where I want them, this is our last chance to get a good look for any particles. Okay, I do see a little. Lint particle right there. See, with the rotical, I just do a little dab real lightly. But see, if I didn't have the rotical, basically I would just use the tweezers. You which just work. Pick away at it. Yeah. Yeah, so just take your time. You know, this, this is a really important process right here, or step. It looks pretty clean. So there was just there was just a couple of specs. Okay. That little dot is that little dot your high point on that inner race there. Okay, yeah, this is okay, this is uh where I'm gonna show you. Okay, the next step is we need to match markings on the bearing to the spindle shaft. Okay, okay. I want to show you two things. Um, okay, both on the, just on the angular contact bearings, you're going to see two markings you want to identify. There's going to be a marking on the inside bearing race and then on the outside bearing race. Okay, the inside bearing race, it's always going to be on the face right here. And depending on the manufacturer, you know, it can be a circle like here, like a letter O. It, we've seen dots, we've seen asterisks, you know. So, you know, and you'll usually be able to read that little pamphlet that comes with your bearing and they'll tell you the symbol they use. Yeah, which one they're looking for. Yeah. Right and basically what these identifiers are, is these identify the high spots that the bearing manufacturer measured. So like where we measured for the high spot in the spindle and made our witness marks, well, the bearing manufacturer did the same thing but they use their little identification marks, you know. Okay, for the outside bearings, again, you'll either see the same type of marking on the outside face right here, or you'll see the marking on the outside race. Or in some cases, I've seen him put the marking on both the side and the top, oh, okay. on, only on the outside race. Okay, so what this means that if we match the marking on the inside race, and then match it to the outside marking, just like that. That means that that's where the high spot is that in this whole position. Pair for both that, both those races together. That's right. Okay. okay. And so what we want to do is, when we install the bearing, when we install the bearings onto the spindle shaft, we only want to pay attention to the inside bearing race marking. So that marking right there. You want to position that to where it's exactly 180 degrees from our witness mark. So what we're doing is, what we're trying to accomplish is, we're trying to cancel each other's high spot out. So, because see, if I were to match the markings, we would be adding the, the high spots on both the bearing and the bearing shaft, I mean the spindle shaft, and we would be adding the run So out. we're creating a bigger oval and we're trying to make an oval back into a circle. Yeah, trying to cancel each other and out. As near as that'll get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So very important, you know, you definitely don't want to match it because then you're going to add to the run out. So, okay, so just like that. So you just want to just take your time. So remember the witness marks facing on the you. spindle are facing me. The mark on the bearing is facing away from me. Okay, and also the arrangement. So I got the right, the writing or the back of the bearing facing up. Yeah. Okay, so let me just... Just double check. And now let me, um, just a little off. So you just take your time. Perfect, okay. And what I like to do is once I got the position correct, just put a little downward pressure, just lightly. You know, make sure I just like to rock it a little bit. So yeah, like, we don't want to get started off on a little bit of a key cocked angle. Exactly. So I don't want it, yeah, exactly. I don't want it to be angled like this and then press it on. So I kind of just rock it back and forth. This side, this side, and it feels looks good. And the witness mark's still facing you. Yep. Perfect. Okay. okay. Just like that. Okay, and I always stand up for this. Do I need to hold anything or are you going to be able to? Um, should be all right. I should be all right. Yeah, I should be all right because I'm going to hold it like this at first. Oh, well, there it goes. There it goes. I get a nice side view. <laughs> okay, just a little bit more. Okay, and just like to always like to just give it a little couple. We want it to sit on that yeah. collar of the. Exactly, I want to just be sure nose. that's seating very well. Okay, take that off. Okay, then with my loop, I just like to get just a visual confirmation that the inner bearing race is seating on, you know, on the spindle edge right there. Fully. Fully. All the way around, just to be sure. I mean, it's hot, odds are good, but. Hey, so I'm just turning this it. This is it. Just want to be sure you yeah, it's sitting perfectly around the entire circumference of the shaft. Okay, it looks really great. Okay, next thing is my witness mark. Make sure my witness mark didn't move. Okay, no, it's still not it's perfect. That good? Okay. One thing I want to know, um, if after you install your first bearing, and sometimes this does happen, as you're installing the bearing, the inner race will move a little. Yeah, it can, it can kind of spiral down the shaft. Yeah. It's happened to us. Yeah, it happens. You know, like where it's at a 12, 12 o'clock position, it may go 1 o'clock or 11 o'clock. A little bit. And don't find, don't, whatever you do, don't remove the bearing. It's not that critical. But what it is, what you want to do if that does happen, Okay, when you install the second angular contact bearing on top, what you want to do is you don't want to match that inner race with the bearing with our witness mark any longer. Yeah, no. You want to match it to the marking on the first bearing. Excellent point. The bearings need to always work. That angular contact pair must always work together. As a set. Oh, that's yeah. correct. Otherwise, they're going to get a little bit of a pressure resistance difference between the two. We want to equalize that as best as possible. That's right. Very, very good point brought up. Okay, let's get the other bearing. Yo, me, um. Okay, just make sure. This one looks really clean. Now it's just the metal. So I'm looking everywhere. I'm looking, you know, inside the cage and then also on the races on the top. I just don't want any, you know, lint or anything anywhere on the bearing. Okay, 
just on the inside right there. Okay, no, that looks really good. Okay. okay here's what I want to do. Okay, because we're going to install this bearing with the markings facing down, Lance is going to hand me a permanent marker. And what I'm going to do is, so that marking... Yeah, because I'm not going to be able to see it anymore. Okay, see that marking right there in the inner rays? Sure do. I just want to place the same marking right on the other side. It's right there. Okay, perfect. See, just a little marking right there. So that way, see that way, now I can use this marking to line it up and see when it seats, then I can be sure this marking matches the witness mark, right. you know, because I'll never be able to see it once they, you know, once there is a set. And now on the outer races, is bring them down to match each other. Are they still adjustable once they're pressed together? Yes. Can we get a little movement to get those? Because we need those two arrows to line up to each you other. You do feel the friction because, you know, because they're being seated and you, and, and basically when we're hammering and they're seated, they essentially from the friction, they do have a preload on them, but it's not that much of a preload that you can't move both races. Without any harm. There Without any harm, okay, right? I just want to make sure we answer that question. There. Definitely. But if you want, you know, it doesn't hurt. If you want to get them close, you know, here make I'll... Make it a little easier on I'll make it a little easier. So I'll match, you know, the arrow with the inner marking right there. I can do the same here. So let me find... Okay, there. So there's the arrow. And I'll match the inner marking to the arrow. That just gets like pretty close, and we'll just touch it up when we get down there. Exactly. That's pretty good. See, I just rock back and forth. Okay, then let's do a visual. Make sure, make sure it looks straight. Yeah, perfect. No wobbling. And just take one last look. This is my last chance to make any adjustments. That second set of eyes, if you have someone that's really into doing this with you, is just great because as long as you both have a little bit of a knowledge, you can put it together as one. It works out real well. It's a lot going on and a lot can be forgotten easy. It really is. It's really good if you, it's really good if you can have two people doing this. And we have a lot of fun doing it and so should you. So it's just, we just enjoy this work. We do. <laughs> Okay, last chance. Markings are down. So we got the back-to-back -back arrangement. We got the markings aligned. And yeah. okay, here we go. Okay, this is so important. You got to double and triple check because once the second bearing's on, you cannot remove these without damaging them. Yeah, that's that decision you have to make. So it's worth it. Okay, I'm just. I do that uh, just to be sure both bearings are seated to each other. Okay, so here. Yeah, yeah. see they're really tight, but you can move them. Just that little bit. But there is a lot of friction because there's a preload now. There you go, that looks nice. Okay. Yeah, so really critical, you want these two to match just like that. That's perfect. Okay. okay. Next step is now we want to, oh, real quick. That's right. Just make sure you want to do a field test. Make sure if the two bearings feel good. Okay, they do. Because this is your last chance. You know, if there's any particles, lint or hair, 
you're gonna feel that and how you feel it almost feels like there's like a piece of sand or something all of a sudden you'll feel, feel a bump yeah even as little as that hair sounds yeah it's these are very sensitive yeah see these feel perfect smooth Okay, now we're ready to grab the headstock housing. So I'll bring it here. Okay, the first thing we want to do is we want to lubricate uh, these bores, the bearing bores in the headstock. But before we do that, I just want to be sure these are clean of any dust or material. So again, I just get my loop. Let me see, where's my vertical? So I want these bores, just like the bearings, I want these bores to be perfectly clean with no lint or anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it looks perfect. There's a lot of bore in there. It's a, the front one's a lot, the front's a lot deeper. Yeah, it is. And then there's a big hollow cavity in the middle of this particular headstock. So you have to really pay close okay. attention to cleaning in there. Yeah. Where the other ones go straight through these days with steps, you know. That's right. Just so that people know that. Okay, in this case, I do both. Well, yeah, because we're going to put it right through yeah. shaft and all. Huh? That's right. Got a real nice finish in them bores there. Real nice. Yeah, it is really nice. And really important, you know, again, this isn't so much about the insertion of the bearings. It's more that, like we've mentioned, anytime you have two parts together. Two metal to metal contact. And metal to metal contact. Material contact area. Yeah. It could be any materials. It's very, you know, we it's a common problem we see, again, is corrosion and rust. So. Threads and holes, threads on staffs, just metal pins. That's you got right. Bearings. You got it. Especially when you're dealing with a product that's. Uh, like this headstock you know, operates around some coolants and, and uh, cutting fluids and what have you. That's right. Okay. Okay, so this is the front. Okay, so we're at the front here. Okay, so again, you know, be sure your your markings on both bearings are perfectly aligned. Okay, and this is what we do. Okay. The position of these markings in relationship to the headstock, there is no, it doesn't have, there it doesn't have to be in any particular position, but just as a habit that we have, um, we always point them facing up. That's right. Put the high spot to the top. That's right. Midnight. Yeah, we just think that's just a good idea. Okay, now this is good. Yeah, we, most of the time, um, just in our experience from doing a lot of these closed style headstocks, most of the time, just like here, it's a nice uh, slip fit. See, it's taking some effort, but I can use my fingers and there's no play whatsoever. Oh, no, it's just barely going. It's the oil that's helping yeah. you get in there, actually. Okay, but here, here's a good opportunity because we actually ran into this problem with the assembly of the 3C, call it headstock. Yep, in in uh, video part 3V, 3, 3C. 3C, that's, that's right. correct. And this is 3D. And, yeah, and if you saw that video, you'll, you know, we we could only push it in partially with our fingers and then we couldn't, it was stuck. Oh, it wasn't it was, having it. It wasn't, it wasn't going having in. it. It was not going to go in. <laughs> no. And you know, it's so tempting to take your hammer or your dead blow hammer or whatnot. Hit your spindle. And hit your spindle. But that's just a bad thing to do. That's, that means you're, you're no support on those outer races being forced into that bore. That's right. Very, very bad. See, by hitting the spindle like that, you're hitting the spindle, which is then hitting the ball bearings and then hitting the outside race you know, to try and make the outside race go into That's the right. housing. And what you're risking is 
putting dents or indentions into the ball bearings. And, and or the race, yeah. Or the race. Yeah, one or the other. And you may not feel it at first. Not today. But not today, but it will definitely shorten the life of the bearing. We guarantee it. Yeah. So what so what we had to do is we had to uh well we couldn't find our tool. So we had to make one. Honestly, I, I just think he likes to turn Delrin because it's a simple, <laughs> a simple product to make. It is it's a, a stringy mess, but, it's, but it, it is, is a nice, fun cutting material. It is fun. So have fun making these Delrin. You can make all kinds of neat tools to help you build your spindle. And this is an easy tool to make. Yeah. See, this one's specific for this uh, style of headstock with the D or WW uh, spindle shaft. And basically, when you make this. There's just two dimensions you have to focus on. The outside dimension is basically the dimension of the outside bearing race. And the, in, the internal yeah, dimension is the dimension of the spindle head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Obviously, you want to bring your tolerances minus. Yeah. Because right. minus on the outside plus on the spindle head. Because you don't, you know, you want it to be. We'll we don't go want on. to bottom out on that spindle, on that uh, headstock body. That's right. You want that bearing to be free to go as far as it feels it wants to go. That's right. That's right. See, and in this case, see, for this purpose, see, it would just go just on here, just like that. And see, then I could get my... And I your second set of hands could securely hold it. Yes, yeah, so I probably get a smaller dead blow hammer. Exactly. You know, you can either go like that. And see, by doing that, we're hitting directly on the outside bearing race. So we aren't touching the ball bearings or the spindle shaft at all. So it's really nice. Yeah. But this tool also serves a second purpose. It does. When we install the slinger part, which goes right Zing. here <laughs> on the head of the spindle shaft, this is also used to press it on. It is. So, perfect. Because it doesn't you, damage that fine aluminum there because it's pretty soft. Yeah, it's pretty soft because, you know, we've shown that, you know, you can use a socket from your socket rent set. Uh, you know, just finding a size is just is just a little larger than the size of the spindle head. But we just dislike any type of tool that's metal on metal. And getting close to that spindle and all. I just that yeah, too. You know, this Delrin's really a safe it's just safe. It's just really safe. It's really tough and hard, but just soft enough that it won't damage. Then you'll always have it. Yeah. Okay. So in this case It's gonna go by hand. Look at that. Really nice. That's how we're used to it. Yeah, this is how most most um, headstock rebuilds. This is you'll be able to push it with your fingers, but we just warn you. So, but look, isn't it? Doesn't it doesn't happen? mean something's wrong, is what we're trying to say. Just because in Part Three C we had to use this this tool, yeah, uh, because it was a little hinged at the end. That didn't mean it was anything wrong with it. it no, it, it just happened to be a little firm. It could have been. It could have been the plus tolerance on that bearing outer race was just higher. That's right, because we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. The tolerance is... And the Levin factory tolerance was at its low. See, that's Could've what... Been. You know, we've explained these before. It's high. But these tolerance markings on the bearings, see, these indicate the tolerances on the internal and external bearing races. So, see, where this is a negative one... That was really small. Yeah, so that means on the outside and inside bearing races, they're minus one micron smaller. Yeah than the you know than the dimension for that bearing size there you go so so and each set can be different yeah we've seen threes and fours and twos. that's right we've seen them all we have and it affects how hard it goes in or out and then there's the factory's headstock tolerances that's true they may be at their high so if two highs run into each other you need your tool <laughs> and see as you can see this retainer ring is a perfect size you can see it sits right inside that recess on the house and headstock housing right there. Doesn't sit flush in there. It just it's flush, but it sticks up out of it. It's not it's not flush to the body. That's on the outside. It goes. Yeah. It's right inside the recess. As right far there. as it can go. Yeah, yeah, perfect. See, see, if that ring was any larger, it would be sitting on the outside of that recess. But worse, you could be blocking the fastener holes around yeah. here. So very critical to... And we need those fasteners to hold this retention. That's, that's right. True. You know, How's so that that's feel? Still great. <laughs> still smooth. And then nice. Okay, great. So far, it looks really good. So what we're going to do next is we're going to install the... 
front bearing cap so we can at least lock in the two angler contact bearings oh that's great yeah and 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 we can then we're going to start our spinning contest all the time that's right <laughs> every time we add a new part you're right we just gonna... did it when you did this and now we're going to put that on and try it again and then we're going to yeah come that's to the back right. and do some more yeah there you go that's all right yeah actually let me do it on this napkin so i don't Okay, because as always, you know, I just add a little drop at the tip of each fastener. Well, those are especially those are brand new. Yeah, brand new. Okay, when we install the front bearing uh, cap, there's no position. No, it's so it's it can go. It can do anything it wants. Yeah, anything you want. Unlike when we install the the slinger cover. That has a specific position, which yeah. we'll get to when we install it. But this, I usually just find the best, you know, more cosmetics. Yeah, well, what faces up at us all day at 12 o'clock or exactly. nine, between 9 and 12 o'clock, basically. So right. we, that's what we look at all day. <laughs> oh, here, let me make sure. Yeah, see, very important. Okay, yeah. see? So this area right here is going to sit right against the bearing right there. So we want to be sure there's On that no, outer race. Yeah, on the outer race. So we want to be sure there's no lint or foreign material right there because that will get into the bearing. Did you grease. get a little oil on this here? Oh, yeah. Thank you. See, I almost forgot I'm going too fast. Okay, let me get my rotical. Just make sure. And the bearing's still clean, right? Yeah, it's always good. Uh, see, at this, this is, so when I install this bearing cap, that's it. We aren't going to see the bearings. We won't see that bearing for a decade. Yes. <laughs> yeah, hopefully that's our, that's our mission. Yeah. So that's why we want to ensure there's no lint or anything. So this is our last opportunity to check for that. Okay, I think that's good. So let me just set this real quick. Just double check. Just one last check. Okay, no, it looks very clean, good. Yeah, again, just a really light coat. And I notice even though you're test spinning this spindle all the time, your grease is still in great proportion all the way around. I, I, it's just because you're just because you're spin, spin testing, it doesn't mean the grease is flinging. Oh, sure, sure. So it looks really consistent all the way around. I've been looking at it. Right, see, see that. that See, it all still looks good. There you go. Good. We're just trying to avoid uh, heat buildup in the end here during the break-in period, basically. That's right. Very altered cap. Yes. Okay. There we go. It fits on really good. Okay. It provides a little tension, right? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, okay. I'm going to... Um, after I... Get them started. Just, yeah, get them started. I'm going to show you at the end how to check to make sure, you know, it's on properly. Oh, great. Okay, so what I do first is I just uh, insert all, this, all the fasteners just by hand. You know, you don't want to tighten anything yet. This is a happy stage to be at, isn't it? Oh, it really is. Yeah, and it all looks so nice to see. Because so much work has been put into this, oh, yeah. you know, up to this stage. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, we're gonna, we hope it's worth it in the end. I'm sure it will be. Okay, so I just go tight a little bit, back off a little. Oh, you do the star pattern for the car. That's right. When I start tightening, it's like putting lug nuts on a car tire. Yeah. You know, you want to do the star pattern. And this provides a tension ring too, so it's really important that you do the star pattern. And probably, probably would help. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm tightening to this, where the fastener stops, and then I back off. Oh, okay, great. there's a reason why I'm doing that. Okay, so remember. Okay, so this okay this this bearing cover actually is not touching touching this house the headstock housing. Right. There's actually a fine little gap. And that's really important. So you should be able to hold up to the light and see, I can see that there's a gap that I can see through to the light. See, that's really important because 
see what it's doing is the cap's just applying pressure on the outside bearing race so it's it has so it's it's applying a constant pressure on that bearing against equally yeah equally around. against that retainer ring that we install and that eliminates can i say the word because sure. i finally get it once more axial load axial load there we play. go yeah <laughs> hard play yeah sorry so, actual movement actual movement right that's right okay so okay so the other thing i want to point out is so when you tighten the first screw you got to be really careful you want because if you just if i just tighten one screw really tight see it can cause this bearing cap to cocking go, to cock yeah. like that so you gotta be very so what i do is you know i hold it against the bearings really tight and then very lightly i just go to the top one it's a very light pressure all around and i start the star pattern so I do this about... Yeah, that gets it level on there, see? Yeah, so I do it about three times. It's all right. Yeah, just take your time. Because this is all that locks on here now. So this one I'm doing, going, see, here, 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 here. Okay. See, just like a star. And this doesn't have to be super tight, just snug. It's not going anywhere. No. How those new fasteners feel. Oh, great. Aren't they nice? And we always enjoy them. How's your tension working there? How's that looking good? Oh. Okay, remember, we added a new part. So you have, you know, give it a test spin. Make sure, you know, it's not binding. Because we don't want to be, you know, we don't want to install five parts and then realize it's binding. And now we're going to wonder what part caused the bind. So that's why you want to test it at each new part. Nice. <laughs> See, no axial play at all. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. This is your dream. This is what you're hoping we just did. We're hoping you've discovered this. That's right. Yeah, this is so important because remember, this right now, we've now completed up to this point uh, the installation, what the modifications we made. That's so right. So if you've done the modifications properly, this should go This smoothly. is a very, very big deal at this it point is. right here. It's a big accomplishment for this stuff, for this There's still stock. risks involved coming steel here, but, but for the most part, that's a great sign to see at this stage. It really is. Okay, so that feels great, doesn't it? Oh yeah, I okay. couldn't wait. I had to sneak over there. <laughs> okay, next part. Okay, here just, so real quick, okay, so and now we have the spindle shaft installed with the two angular contact bearings. We've got the bearing cap, you know, fastened. Yeah. So now what we're going to do is we're going to install the bearing spacer with the locking collar. See, and it goes this way. See, just and like there's that. there's your locker. There's your pin and there's your, your six, six slots and there's your little part there. That's right. Okay, so we got that part. Okay, and then my key is over here. Oh, if you're wondering why my key was in the uh, dust cover, I was using it to hold the bearing with the retaining ring. Oh. You know, so it wouldn't fall over. People are wondering, why are you keeping your key? <laughs> we're not that dust. far out. Yeah, we're at that particular <laughs> for dust. Yeah, okay, so. Okay, most important, we want to apply a light coat of oil. Make sure we get the inside. Slip a little on that key. Did you do the key? And not yet. Oh. Usually the key I I oil with the leftover oil on my fingers. Oh yeah, it's so it, small. Right. And there's always plenty of oil. No matter what you think, that little bit of oil is so refined it goes a long ways. It does. So I try to get every. Yeah, see what you mean? See, you did the key. Okay, see there's a key installed. Right. Sure, it's in there really good. Okay, then what I like to do is 
Okay, so remember, so we're gonna insert this in first, so like that. Okay, so okay, so this side, this rests against the internal bearing race on the angular contact bearing right here. Okay, and then this side's gonna rest against the inner race of the deep groove bearing. So you wanna be sure that both ends are perfectly clean without oh, any particles, dust, hair. Okay, looks good. Well, that one, that key's gonna hold in, huh? Yeah. Okay. We usually go the other way for, because yeah, it doesn't so hold. Yeah, fall out, yeah. exactly. If you have problems with your key holding, just turn it the opposite from up to down and run it, because then it won't fall out. Yes. <laughs> a little bit painful. Yeah, so I, I just like to push it in there. Well, that sounded good. See, there we go. Let's look through that side hole and see how we're lining up. Oh, real nice for the locking pin. I see the future coming. Yeah, that's what you want to do. See, you can see the locking collar right through here. See, because the, the plunger, locking plunger is going to go. And so get so it that hole needs to see those six slot, one of those six slots, because if it doesn't, we put that deep groove bearing on and there's nothing we can do about it. That's right. So it has to be verified right now. Yeah, see it? See it right there? All right, so let me um, do this. Let me turn the spindle and you can see it better. Yeah, see, there you go. So you can see the notches moving. See, there's a notch there. Not and that's what you should see. Yeah. As long as you see that, you got that in there right, you're doing good. Perfect. Okay. Okay, great. So, okay, so we got that. Okay, next is, I think we're ready for the deep groove bearing. Well, one of the one of the risky parts of this little assembly. Okay, so we're going to use our hockey puck. Okay. Okay, and Lance is going to help me. Okay, this should stand on, on its own for now. No, it no, needs your help. Too heavy to the base, huh? Oh, actually, you wanna um, hand <laughs> me the the dead blow hammer and then and also the uh, post and die. Okay, make sure I have all the parts. Let me have oh. up. Here, okay. Just double shifts, making sure. Yeah, it's always good to have two people because. Uh, you know, always an extra person to double check your work. Yep. See? There's the bearings. You see there? And now the bearing. Okay. Okay, I think we're ready. Oh, actually, let me do this. So you don't have to hold it there forever. Let me check this bearing. You know, I want to oil it, but first I want to be sure there's... Okay, you're going to put a little oil on it so that it... Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what I'm doing now is we're gonna install the deep groove bearing. I just wanna be sure there's no lint or anything first. Now you see why we don't unpackage these till we just absolutely have to grease them and we're ready to use them because you just have to, it, it just it requires constant eye maintenance to keep an eye on the lint situation or dust or particles of any kind. Oh, it really does. Okay. Good. Yeah, I always like to just pull a very light coat of Now on this bearing, can I ask a question? Yeah. So you're oiling it all? Okay, so just, you know, I'm adding oil on the entire length of the spindle because the deep groove bearing is going to get installed in here. So we want to be sure there's light coat of oil here as well. And then just really light coat of oil on the outside bearing race and also on the bore right here. And that's going to help with the installation of the bearing, you know, slide better. Okay, on the deep groove bearing, the orientation doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. So there's no position, no position on the spindle or on the housing or even the orientation. 
Okay, you know, this, no back or front, no. no front or back, but, but the rule of thumb here. But the rule of thumb I like to use is the side of the bearing that has the writing, I would like to face outward. Yeah, we know that practice from all of our uh, like for the motor rebuilds. Electric motor rebuilds, yeah. right. So that we know what bearing they were if we need to replace them in the future or the next person needs to replace them in the future to be able to get that number right off there if they needed to. That's right. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that on the... See, these are ABEC7 Super Precision Deep Groove Bearings. And it's really unfortunate that the bearing manufacturers, unlike the Angler Contact Bearings, they don't mark the high spot. So, so you can't, there's nothing to match uh, to your witness marks on the spindle. We just have to put it in with trust. That's I mean, right. I, I imagine it's really precise though. Right. But there is one manufacturer, I've seen only one manufacturer of all the bearings we've worked with, and that's Tim, from Timkin. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but so if you don't see any markings in your super precision deep groove bearing, don't, you know, don't worry about it. It's, it's normal. Okay, then what I do is, you know, I try just a little pressure. So make sure it gets a flush, flat, square pressure on it, huh? Yeah, and I, I kind of rock it. So I rock it back and forth. Yeah. And then I do the top and bottom rock it. See, I heard it. Moved a little bit. Yeah, moved a little it closed bit. closed that gap a little. Exactly. So what I'm doing is I want, I want the bearing to seat so it's perfectly perpendicular with the spindle shaft. Yeah. Because see if it, I, we don't want to, we don't want to be pounding on it if it's crooked like this. We want it perfectly perpendicular. Okay, so back and forth, back and forth. Okay, now it feels really good. Okay. Let's see. I'll let you take. Got it? Yeah. yeah. It's flush. It's flush to the puck. Okay, and as always, like to stand up for this. Okay, this really, you just want to take your time because remember, uh, we're, we're installing the bearing onto the shaft, but at the same time, we want to make sure the bearing goes in really nice. And it's the and bearing easy shaft in the housing right here. And it's the bearing shaft knows it's sitting on the puck, so there's no additional pressure being applied here. That's right. And it's really slow. Okay, perfect. That's a good sign right there. Okay, it's flush. Let's confirm that. Hmm. I would like to give it a couple of good hits just to make sure it's seated really well. Okay. Did you give it a test drive? Oh, no, I wouldn't dare. I'm letting that up to you there. Feels great. I want to give it a you test drive. Oh, yeah, now I do. Oh yeah, see, because there's no load on that bearing, it feels the same as it did with two, except it's a lot. It, yeah. it is a lot more secure in my mind because it's got. Yeah, uh, it feels really like, good, huh? Oh, silky, yeah. silky smooth, just perfect. Oh, it's nice when we get our spindles and brand new again. Okay, great. Well, that completes this section. It does. Okay, so um, we'll yeah we'll be back uh, for the next section, and that's going to involve uh, completing the assembly of the spindle. You know, so that's going to involve uh, the belt pulley, the spindle nut, and and then prior to doing that, we're also going to install the lock, the, pl the locking plunger. Okay. You know, so those three and parts. And that just leaves the slinger for last, and the hardware on the bottom. That's right. Okay. So we're so almost great. home. We are. But almost this is a good. This right here is pretty much. Let me. Can I elaborate? Sure. Please. That's a big deal, right? It there. really is. To have that feeling, and when you're told something can't be done. We're pretty proud people. Really, yeah. It's really satisfying. I'm glad we can offer this with you, to, to you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, great. We'll be back. Part 3D, Section 6, Installing the Belt Pulley and Spindle Nut with an Added Bonus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, because before we install these two parts over here, uh, the Spindle Nut and the Belt Pulley, we actually need to install the locking plunger first, and that's what all these parts are for. Yeah, there's 10 parts to that plunger. Yeah, there are a lot of parts, aren't there? And I would think, why would you need to take that apart and put it back on there like that? Well, <laughs> we're going to get into that in a minute, but you know, I wanted to tell you, I already ate. It's a good thing because my smorgasbord is shrinking. <laughs> it is. My parts are getting eaten up here <laughs> going inside of this house here. Yeah. And uh, so we're getting a little more excited as we move along here toward the end. Oh, we are. And that spindle spinning like it does, it's got me excited. 
Because we didn't know. Oh no, you well, don't. You don't know. You do not know. Yeah. So awesome. All right. Hmm. Oh, we're gonna build a little sub assembly. Yeah. Ten little parts to this little guy, and it has a quite a reason for it because it's that locking pin, huh? And you know that you get harmonics from the spindle spinning along with the pulley, the belt, and the pulley, and all that. And if this isn't built right. That's right, and if especially if you haven't taken this apart completely like we're showing, you definitely need to do that and cling it thoroughly. Oh, because it gets corrosion and stuff over the years because it's moving part right there. You know, and it really does. Lubricants and, and, and coolants and chips and little fragments of everything from plastic and glass to, to titanium. <laughs> yes. So you name it. Yeah, that's true. So it has a real important function, though, doesn't it? It really is important that it's built right and that that holds its retention correctly. It really does. That's why it has those sophisticated little parts he's going to share when he builds it. Because you notice I'm oiling everything. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you didn't hear me complaining, did you? <laughs> so you know I know you're oiling. <laughs> <laughs> I think I ought to work for that oil company the way I push that stuff. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this, this is the part that gets inserted into the front of the headstock this way. Okay, so... How we install this is we install the pin first with the pin going in first. See, and then the thread stays out because that's that's uh, the thread where the knob gets fastened. Oh, yeah. That's my little handle. My yeah. Little, yeah. Okay, so we insert that. Okay, notice how there's a little notch there? Yeah. So that notch is because we're going to install the ball bearing and then the spring and then the set screw. And that's where we develop that's the what, tension, huh? Yeah, and that's what's going to lock it in place. It's going to lock it when you push it in, in lock position, and when you pull it out, in unlock position. And most importantly, when you pull it out. That's right. It stays out and doesn't vibrate in and get caught in one of those six grooves. Those are not good things to have happen to your spindle. No. So, no. so this tension setting is really, really important that it has that right amount of pop to it. Right? It really does. That's one tiny set screw. Isn't it? Can I start off by just going flush? It's nice because if you want extra tension, you can tighten it more. Yeah. How's that feel? Good? Oh yeah, it feels really good. Nice. You can hear that. You hear that little it click? Isn't it? Click. It's a little bit more intense when it's actually installed. A little bit. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay, then what I do is, I like to install this. Okay, so we got the, uh, so I like to install where that set screw is facing back. See, in this case, it'd be facing back. Okay. Because we don't want it facing up or down toward the... Yeah, front. we either wanted it basically 6 o'clock or 9 o'clock or anywhere over that way. We don't want it at 12 midnight. We don't want it at 3-ish. Yeah, see, the screw pattern on the 3C headstock's a little different. So we yeah, were did able you notice to, that? Yeah, so we're able to point it a little different, so. But either way, we get it out of the way of that splinging spindle there. Huh. That's right. Is that a little oil at the tips? We even use that spindle to tighten that little head on that little knob there, don't we? Uh, the what? I'm sorry. When we do this little knob, we even use the spindle tension. Oh yeah. To, to, so we can tighten it on correctly. That's There's right. no other way to do it. It's a little tiny shaft that spins. That's and right. Those are awfully nice cold blued parts we reinstalled on there. Yeah, isn't that nice? Okay, if you notice, I haven't I haven't put the knob on first, and I'm going to show you. Uh, we, we do it very last. Yeah. I'm going to show you how we do it. Because the screws have to clear it too to get started right That's here. That's right. right. Unlike the 3C, this one actually has a hole to go into. This, this assembly goes into it. Yeah, it's recessed. Yeah, recessed. So thank really you. Nice. That was the word I was open for. Recessed. <laughs> thank you. Okay. 
I'll just move these over. Okay, so what I do is... A little trick of the trade. Yeah, so... Okay, so I push it in and make sure the spindle's locked. And this is what I do. So with it pushed in and locked, I then turn this clockwise and I apply pressure on the pin. See? So it won't turn. And that, that allows me to then screw on the knob. And get a nice amount of tension on it. Yeah, because it doesn't have to be on that tight. See, I could tell. Yeah, see, just like that. There, see? Want to try it? Oh, yeah. You can try it like that, see? I like that sound. See? Yeah, see, very nice. Probably a little bit more. See, but it's adjustable. So I think it just went a little tighter. Don't you think so? I think so. We just don't want it to ever pop. Oh, yeah, see, that's better. Is that better? Did it get it better? Because you use this a lot, so... Oh, yeah. That's a lot tighter. Yeah, just, you know... It'll fit in. You know, it's going to wear in a little. It's gonna yeah, it's going to wear in. in a little bit. A little adjustments, a little, just a quarter turn is going to make a difference. Oh, yeah, don't so go you, cuckoo. Yeah, so you can play with it, yeah. but it's definitely adjustable. So maybe perfect. it's a little too much for you or not enough, but remember, the main goal is to keep it from harmonically moving in and locking itself in the hole, a, a slot while that spindle spinning. That's right. Through the harmonics. Okay, and especially uh, now what I test for is, you know, I pull it out, make sure it's in the out, unlock position, and then I turn and I listen to make sure you don't have, you don't have anything hitting. Oh, like that pin rubbing on the, on that maybe the, even the outer uh, diameter of the That's slots. right on the, the high stop of the high locking stop. collar, right? Yes. So no, it's just completely. These are good free. things to listen very close. That's why we don't want you know listen to any music or anything when you're doing this work. We want to listen to the spindle talk to you. That's right. That's perfect. Sure looks nice with a little red knob. It's a nice change for us. <laughs> Okay, great. Now let's um take a look at that bearing a little bit before we do this, right? That's right. Okay, just like the front bearing, I get my loop and just make sure the back of the deep groove bearing is dust free. This too we won't be seeing for we hope one decade or more right there. <laughs> so that's, that's right. It. Okay, so that's perfectly clear. Again, I could add a little bit of oil. Because yeah, anytime we install a bearing, you know, the bearing will scrape a lot of the oil down. Yeah, it brings it with it. Yeah. Typically, yeah. Hey, when you slide this in, will you slide it really slow when you get to the end there? Oh, so, sure. I like something this does, and I like to share it. And this is what happens when you buy our, our own really fine, high-precision spindles. These are little tricks of the building industry of, of, of spindles, you know. Okay. See, what Lance is talking about is this belt pulley actually does two functions. Yeah. It's the belt pulley, obviously. But what's nice is you'll see... It's recessed right there, and you'll see that the belt pulley actually goes into that groove right there. So it kind of provides a seal for that bearing. Yeah, it really keeps the foreign objects out. And remember, yeah, see, just like that. Yeah, and remember, that's a lot of effort considering in the end, just real quick, if I may. Yeah. Is it still gets this belt cover pulley. So it's got all this protection built around here. That's right. Plus, they did that inside where you don't see it, and then you have this protective cover on top of that. So it's really quite uh, a good reason to why these uh, spindles are so high quality. No, really. Yeah, everything just fits so precision. Here's one I'm telling tiny you, key. Each headstock has its own personality because on a 3C headstock, 
this one went right in. Look at that, perfect, right there. Just make sure that key fits in at least flush. And it stops yeah. against what, the bearing race there? Yeah. Okay, so, so don't a, worry about it falling in or going yeah. somewhere. Just make sure it's there. Yeah, just make sure it's there and in, at least flush. Because then the nut's going to come on and it's going to, everything's going to stay where it's put. That's right. That is really nice. Sure is looking nice. Okay, at this point, I, I'll lock there. Okay, that's nice. Okay, now I'm gonna lightly oil my spindle nut. Okay, I'm just making sure it looks good. No foreign particles or anything. No, right, it's just really... applying direct pressure equally all the way around when it, when it goes up against that pulley. That's right. Okay, what I do is I try to go as far as I can just on my fingers. That's the way it's good and down the threads quite a ways there. See. Yeah, and it should go on very smooth. You know, if it's if it's binding, you know, check I wouldn't go all the way. I'd I'd remove the spindle nut and check the threads, make sure there's no, you know, dirt or That's or what anything. we do when we prep all these parts. We make sure all these parts are gonna be okay when we do this assembly. So you should Pay that kind of note. Should already know that when you get here. But that's right. If you have a problem, you just need to study it a little bit. Don't force it. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah, this is what I do is is I just I keep one of my fingers on the plunger just because I don't want it to pop out good by practice. accident. You know, you never know. I want it very secure. Okay, and then I'm using our smallest spanner, meaning the one with the smallest pin size, which is 1.5 millimeter. Okay. Okay. Now it's just turning, right? Yeah. Okay. Getting tension yet? Uh, yeah. Okay, they're right there. I just want to get a good hold on it. Okay, remember, this doesn't have to be super tight, just snug. Yeah. So make sure I okay, got this good. A little bit there, that was it. Okay. That's all that. Right there, it stopped. I right saw there. that, yeah. See? Don't That's force it. it. That's it. Because you got to watch why we have a locking screw. Right. And make sure you pull out your your locking plunger. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, that feels beautiful. Oh, yeah, that pull is right in line. Everything's just beautiful. Yeah, isn't oh, that nice? Oh wow! I can't wait to run that. Okay, when you're at this stage, okay, this really is a big accomplishment at this stage because. The spindle itself, the spindle shaft assembly is 100% done. That's it. And so if it if you reach this stage and it spins smoothly, tight, you know, no play, there shouldn't be any axial play and no radial play, you know. If it, I mean, even though it doesn't have the slinger on it or, or the locking nut yet, what he's saying is those things can all be fixed. Anything that's right. right here. As long as you have this scenario done with your locking pin and everything, you've got it. Right. Once your spindle nut is fastened and tightened, that means your spindle assembly, you know, all the bearings have the preload on them and, and the whole assembly yeah. is tightened up. Yeah. So so if you so this is where if you're gonna get any type of binding, you're definitely gonna see it at this stage. Oh, I would, yeah, you know? it would have been either by putting that that uh, deep groove bearing in the back. That's could have been right. There, could have been your could have been your your locking uh, collar. Yeah, the locking collar because it's gonna be rubbing on by, something. Yeah, because if you didn't fill it by then, especially tightening the spindle nut, that's just gonna amplify it. Right. You know. So no, it's, but it feels great. No binding whatsoever. So if you're feeling what we're feeling right now. You're. You're in a good place. Yeah. So happy, great. You'll be happy and smiling <laughs> like the two of us. <laughs> yes. So there you go. Uh, you want to put your locking screw in now or you want to? Oh, yeah. See, I almost forgot. This is where. That's why an uh, extra set of eyes kind of really works out around here. Well, I was so excited. I know you were. 
Do you have a driver for that? Yeah, this just takes a little tiny flathead screwdriver. Oh, it is tiny. Okay. Just a real small screw, just be careful with it. We're gonna go down, we're gonna squeeze those, that slot, right? Yeah, because um slot groove in the nut. Yeah, the nut, the nut, the half of it. They saw it right in, they, so right it's a in the split center, nut like thing. Yeah, it's a split nut. So when you tighten the fastener, it brings those two halves together and applies pressure to the thread, so it won't loosen over and time. And just a little bit now, nothing. Yeah. don't go cuckoo. Don't, don't ruin your threads. Yeah, because you will ruin the threads if you tighten it. So just snug. That's all that's required. There, okay. that's it. There you go. That's one perfect spindle. Almost done. Great. Good. Okay. We're almost there. I think we have one section left in order to 100% complete the full assembly. Yeah. So, and I think that's the slinger, the slinger cover, and then the clamping hardware. Yeah, uh, that's that's going to be it. Yeah. So, okay, great. So, yeah, we've a big accomplishment. Happy day over here. Happy day. So, we'll be back. Part 3D, Section 7. Installing slinger and mounting parts. Let's zing it over to Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, getting exciting because we're almost oh, done here. It is, isn't it? Okay, we're going to install. First thing we're going to do is we're going to install the slinger uh, onto the uh, spindle head. Then, after we do that, then we're going to install the slinger cover. And then, after that's done, we're going to install the, the mounting hardware. And then that finish wraps up this section. Can you believe it? We've gotten this far and oh, successful. And, and successful. We hope you are too. Yeah. So great. Now okay. that's a soft aluminum part there. Yeah, you gotta be really careful with installing this because it's just, it's really thin and soft aluminum. Okay. And there's two ways to install this. Okay. Uh, one of the ways you can do it, we don't really recommend it, but what you can do is you can use a socket from your socket set. And what you do is just select the size that's just slightly larger than the diameter of the spindle head. Right. And then what you can do is just use that. So you put the slinger on, you know, snug. And it can't be too much bigger than it because the the, the whole the whole body of that slinger that needs to go in well, that bang. slot needs to be pushed from that nearest to the spindle. That's right. So if so it's it right, Lance that. is saying if the if that socket's too large, it's gonna press on the outer you know, edge, and that can bend the slinger. And at the same time, I would recommend, I don't want to see you damage your spindle because you're using that hardened steel socket that That's we all right. have in our basic machine shop toolbox. Right. Uh, to harm it here is just also. Be, if, you, if, you, if you use that option, just be extremely careful. Take your time. But what we recommend is we use our Delrin tool. Okay, this is the same tool that we use when, uh, when when we can't press in the angler contact bearings into the oh which housing. happened on this spindle huh was it this on the three C the three C we had yeah. that problem we yeah. normally don't yeah yeah most headstock rebuilds you just, can you can just with your finger pressure you can insert that pair of angler contact bearings but just occasionally you're gonna need to make a tool out of Delrin you know to assist you you know to push them into the housing. Right. But if you if you if you may happen to make that tool, that same tool can be used to insert, you know, the slinger. And we like it. And we like it. It's just I mean, so much softer. I mean, even safer. if you don't need the tool for your angler contact bearings, we recommend making it anyway, at least for the installation of the slinger. Yeah. You know. Because it's so, so frail. Yeah. But so important. So important. It plays a major role here for longevity. Really does. Okay, so what I do first is, okay, we don't have to oil this. No. Okay. Um, okay, what I do first, okay, I notice I'm looking for my witness marks. Uh -huh. See how my witness marks have almost disappeared just from hand doing. Yeah, this is our, this is where we remove them right here, right? Yeah. This is where I use this isopropyl alcohol. You know, this is a 99.9%, .9%, you know. I'm not sure if we've mentioned that uh, lately. Well, I'll mention it again. That's really okay. important. You want to use a 99.9% version of isopropyl alcohol because any less means it has water content. And we're fighting water here. That's our, right. our battle with this spindle and its long-term life is anti-water. 
Yes, don't go to your hardware or your hardware. Don't go to your drugstore and get rubbing alcohol. No. You know that seventy percent because like if you get seventy percent, that means thirty percent of it's water. You might as well shoot the thing down with yeah. a garden hose. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, but still. So just a little bit. I'm using again the lint-free cloth. You know, just clean it really well. It's a little dark, so there is a little bit of that permanent marker it left. Just smeared around a little. Yeah. You're also taking off all my oil. That's right. So we're going to have to apply a coat of oil uh, again. Okay, good. That's nice and clean. Yeah, last thing you want to do is get the spindle down and see these witness marks for the high spots. Exactly. It just lacks professionalism, you know. You want to keep that mystery to yourself. Exactly. Still spinning really nice. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially this headstock. It's just extra satisfying uh, to see this get rebuilt. Yeah. Just because it is the unrebuildable headstock. Yeah, and it's and, uh, looks looking rebuilt to me. <laughs> okay, so what I do is, okay, again, you know, we don't have to oil this because it's just aluminum. So what I do is I try to press it on just with my fingers a little bit. You know, okay. And I try to make sure it's at least straight. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Again, it's it's just aluminum, so it's not going to be. You know, if it if it wobbles a tiny bit, that's fine. There's really nothing you can do it, about it's it. It's made. It's really, really thin. Really thin. Probably by design. Okay, let's... I'm going to support it from the bottom of the spindle, the full spindle shaft. Okay. Is there a tool? And just really lightly, and I'm I'm just using a little our smaller dead blow hammer. That's all it needs. It doesn't need much. I saw that. Yes. You probably felt that. I did. Oh, that's a nice uh, looking pretty good. I'd come back up here. Yeah, probably up there. Yeah, right in there. I would. No, so I think it's... Is that all we're going to get? Yeah, I think that's all we're getting. Okay. Yeah, see how it's, it's a little bent? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but still it's not touching. I mean... Um, the main, yeah. I really hate, you know, I know sometimes it bothers us. It's like, you know, because it's such a precision headstock and it's like it kind of bothers us. But again, we it's such thin aluminum. We really, what we're more concerned with is it rubbing against the slinger cover. Right, the cover or that back. Either I don't want it to hit anything, right? That's we, right. We don't want to obviously it's gonna, have it hit. The, it needs to float in that center section. If it's wobbly, so what? As long as it's floating in that center section. Yeah, because see, it's going to ride in this cavity right here. Yes. So what's going to happen is, see, if any form material gets through here, it's going to hit the slinger. See, as this is spinning, and the centrifugal force is going to cause any particles that hit it to fly off and it's going to hit this wall. Uh -huh. So when you install the slinger cover, it's critical that the slot right here points down because as the particles hit the wall, gravity is going to pull that down to the bottom and then it's going to fall down. And you may say to yourself, oh, well, who wouldn't know that? Well, yeah, you... how many spindles have we seen? With oh. the... I don't know. I thought some people thought it was a smokestack. Yeah, we've seen this pointing up. We've seen it pointing to the sides. It is so common, you wouldn't believe it. You just throw it on and go, oh, well, whatever. Yeah. So very important. It has to face down so gravity causes the particles, you know, to fall out. And you need liquids or anything else that we want to get that out of as quick as possible or as easy as possible, huh? That's right. Okay. I'm just making sure. Okay, so not touching. Oh, no. I almost forgot. I a little light. Coat of oil. 
Now notice this bottle's not going down. That's how little we're actually using, right? Can I just kind of share that a little bit? Sure. It, we it, we start out with very little and it's just, it, it would have, you wouldn't be able to register what we've used. Uh, no, you wouldn't. Just, but just so you know, because I know it's hard to understand that through the We're videos. just using little drops here and there. And, and it goes a long ways, this particular oil, yeah. It really does. Nye oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, just little drops at the end of each fastener. And I just roll them because, again, we don't need that much oil at the tips. Okay. okay. Loose again. Yeah, same thing. Just, just back. I'm out. going in and just backing off a little. It's just good practice. And then doing the star pattern again. It's just good practice. Even though this one's gonna end up just sitting flush, right? It just goes right up there. Yeah. Yeah. See, it doesn't have any stamps up. Yeah, it, it sits flush, so there's no uh, no chance of it going crooked. Right. You know, like like the bearing cap. Bearing cap's more critical, but yeah, much more critical. Still want to perform that way this practice. No, like you said, yeah, it's always to it's just good practice, so you're used to it. You know, you know it just becomes second nature. Yeah. Anybody who's changed tires on a car knows that, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So now I'm going to just snug in the star pattern now. Okay, now this is going to my last tightening. Sure is looking nice. Look at how nice it looks to see that. Cosmetics are all fixed. Look at how pretty that is. Yeah, see, look how nice oh, it looks how now. Nice. See all that damage that we we're able to take that face cut, just remove it. Looks beautiful. See, just turn it upside down for a second. Upside down. Oh. See, there's that. There's that. What it looks like with that little uh, drain. Yeah. Facing pointing straight down there. It's nice to see. Okay, and again, we just point. Listen to it. Okay, so feel and listen. And just because if it's great, if that slinger scrapes at all, you'll definitely hear oh, it. You're not and gonna, you'll you're feel gonna it. Fix that. You'll feel it as well. So yeah, perfect. That is really nice. So that's actually so that's actually official, hundred percent on the spindle wise. Spindle yeah, wise, want to give it a oh, try? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, we wish you could be here with us yeah. to spin this. This feeling, if you've ever done it, is if you're you maybe doing it now. Um, this is Hopefully, a good, yeah. good and happy smile. You can't, we can't give any <laughs> smiles. So, oh, that's nice. Oh, we say it all the time, but you know, until you actually rebuild a spindle and and fill this, well, it just it's there's no other feeling. Oh, uh, there's just an overwhelming satisfaction that comes over you about having such precision quality work completed like that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, now we're gonna mount the clamping hardware. Okay. So again, you know, so I've got the two holes right here, you know, so that's for these bolts. And this is where it has that eccentric surface right here. So see the clamps going like that. Yeah, inside of there. Yeah, inside. See these, they go in there. So it's like this. And there's a spring see? down under there. And then yeah. See, and see, when you turn this, it, it pulls in the clamp. So that way, that's what locks the headstock down onto the lake and bed. And it locks it on that bed. It really does. And for the springs, it's the oils from on my fingers is fine. Oh, yeah, that's a really small spring. Really small diameter spring. Yeah. Now, when these were blued, can I share that? Oh, please when these, do. When these were blued, these were all oiled already internally. 
and then it was completely cleaned off pretty much just just you know to make sure they were done right that's right you did oil them because we don't know so in case they sit for a while you don't want them to get any kind of corrosion or rust or anything so he, he's just adding a little extra oil back to it because i didn't want to leave that mm. layer on them. and especially that these are moving parts yeah it's fine it has a little extra oil too. yeah and i got them in the socket heads and everything to make sure you know that's when i right. do that when i do the after the bluing it's part of the bluing process hmm. yeah there that was weighing good I want to fix. I always like to test them. Okay, it feels good. Okay, now the bolts. Okay, so what do you do? Is you just push them down a little? Should go right in. Lift up. That's what we want to see. Push down. There. Okay. Do you have one? You want me to turn it sideways while you do it? 532, yeah. Let's see if they can see that. Let's say, uh, let's bring it up like that. Like that? Yeah. Let's see, oh yeah, that's perfect right there. So you just, so you can see it. See, see it how they go up and down, down like pistons. Exactly. A little cam driven screw turns a piston. It's kind of neat. Yeah, so it's just like that. So perfect. And those would, of course, close in on the on the T slot of the of the of the blade bed and lock it on there. That's right. And you'll know it. <laughs> you'll know. You'll it. know it. Trust me. So great. Oh, how there you beautiful! Go. Look at that. What a beautiful spindle! What an exciting day! Oh yeah, looks good. It feels, feels great. Good. Oh yeah, feels great. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, the next step for this headstock is. It's going to get its breaking procedure. Yeah. You know, and then part of that, uh, prior to doing the breaking procedure, we also take a test indicator on the collet seat right here just to get a baseline reading to see what we're looking at. And in see terms if we of have to precision. grind it or not. Right. Because there's two cases where we need to re grind the collet seat. If, we, if the tolerance, the total indicator right now doesn't look very good, you know, if it's not within specification of 50 millionths of an inch. Or sometimes a collet seat will just get worn out because, you know, the collets are, as you're tightening and loosening the collet on that collet seat, after These some the years collets of have use. These collets have made their cozy seating in there. Yeah, and sometimes. And it needs to be re revisited for, to be refreshed. It just get a nice fresh surface. And that'll draw back much better accuracy going forward. Exactly. So those two conditions is when we'll do, a, a, you know, we'll regrind this collet seat. And, um, you know, we won't show that on of camera because in what was it part four we actually do a breaking procedure on an open style headstock from levin which is where this is going next yeah and for all the levin spindles for their headstocks their uh, the accessory spindles they all go through the identical same breaking procedure and that breaking procedure checklist is downloadable at activeadam.com that's right and i didn't have this for all these years of doing these breakings no. so you get the luxury of of our if you get the fruits of our labor on that one and it's a nice checklist to monitor checking it every five minutes for temperatures as you go and it's just fantastic if you haven't seen it go watch part four that's right it's going to tell you a lot about where you're about to go next that's right and on one of these headstocks in part five, we will be regrinding the collet seat, and we will be showing that to you. And um, at this stage, uh, we know we aren't going to do it on the open style headstock because the collet seat's in great condition. There's nothing and to the grind. And the tolerance, wow, we're measuring a, a total indicator run out of under 30 million to an inch. Right, God, really tight. And, but we'll find one to grind for you. Yeah. One of these, it, will it can get ground, ground if it, yeah. Yeah, it's either going to be this headstock or it's going to be the 3C closed style headstock. But I'm going to tell you, for some of these as old as they are, you they're sure built well. They don't need much grinding. We're not talking about taking off a whole lot here. No. We're just talking about basically cleaning it up. That's right. Part 3D, Section 8, Final Thoughts. And oh boy, just a few things. We weren't quite 100% done yet. And here's why. That's true. Technically, it's not 100% done. No, There's it's actually not. two more parts. And those parts kind of have to be earned. That's right. They don't just go on here willy nilly. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> so, which one you would like to start with? The placard? 
Well, uh, why does it earn that? its plaque? How does it earn its plaque? That's true. Okay, it spins nice in your hand, but what's got to happen? Let me show you what Lance is talking about. See those two holes right there? Okay, that's where that metal plaque goes on, and but the headstock has to earn that plaque. It does. And it Badge of honor. Yeah, it only earns it after it passes the breaking procedure, and then if it needs a, a new regrind on the collet seat, you know it has to have that procedure yep. done, and only until those procedures are completed. Then it earns its metal badge. It gets its little badge of honor. And just oh, one thing I want to mention, uh, you know, the factory, they install these metal tags with, they're, they're called nail pins. Yeah, there's one of those little, those little like uh, candy cane grooves on them and they go. Rrr. That's right. <laughs> and we hate them. Can't stand them. They're a pain in the butt to remove. Try to drill one out. <laughs> and you know how you can know how, how everybody hates them? Because people leave them on, they tape around them to paint them. They'll do anything but take them off. <laughs> yeah. So what we do is, once we get them off, we actually tap the holes, and then we'll use little tiny miniature fasteners to reattach the metal tag. And of course, if necessary, we rework the, ta the tag that goes That's on there. That's right. You know, we, we, this is a 100% factory work done here, okay? That's right. There it is. That's what it will get. And this is, this is a brand new one just to show you. It's just a sample, yeah. Yeah, just a sample, but that's how it look. Sam has the two holes right there. So then when it's all got that on it, that means she's a certified, proud to own it, factory approved Levin headstock. That's right. But she gets installed. Something else else still has to happen. A couple things. Yeah. Okay, so after it's certified with its metal tag, we install it on the lathe bed. We go ahead and we fuse a belt to it. And then once that's done, it gets its belt pulley. And then, you know, it has the two fasteners right here. You know, it just installs right on the back, you know, just like this. It does. See, just like that. In our case, the belt comes out the back here to this slot. Yeah, see, the belt can actually come down through the bottom or through the back. And that's if the motor's underneath and if the motor's on the table. That's right. There you go. And, um, it depends on what you're using. And that's official. Once that's done... Well, that's it. This is ready to go start then, making another thousands upon thousands of parts. That's right. So, so great. So, obviously, we can't show that to you. No. Because we, it still has to go through those uh, break-in procedure and possibly uh, grind. Yeah. So, go watch part yeah. four and enjoy that because that's what you're doing next. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. Hope you enjoyed this uh, part. We sure did. We sure did. That's for sure. Okay. The unbuildable is rebuildable. Rebuildable. Great. As watchmakers and micro machinists, Patrick and I thank you for following along with us while we take this journey. We look forward to bringing you another exciting show shortly.